if there was a motion, I didn't get it. I Sorry. don't think we had okay. one. I don't think so. Um, a motion to approve the uh, tobacco license and what was the other one called? Uh, tobacco substitute endorsement. I would, I would so move, Judy. Okay. Uh, a, a second? Oh, second. A motion and a second. Any um, questions on this, Jason? All right, thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> motion has passed. Special event applications? No. All right. Uh, a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. And there was a second. I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we are out of liquor control. Let's move into select board meeting. And uh, before we start, I'd like to welcome Chris to the board. Um, I uh, uh, want to just say that um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to serve the town of Morristown. Um, I know that my nomination and selection was not without some controversy and um, discussion. I hope over the next 10 months um, I can uh, prove myself worthy of the position and work with the citizens of Morrisville to come to good conclusions moving forward. Um, <coughs> my cell phone is available through the town office. I've given them permission to, to disseminate that to anybody. If you want to talk to me after the meeting, I'd be glad to give it to you. I want to make myself as available to folks as I possibly can. And uh, hopefully moving forward, I'll be a, a good partner in this. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'd also like to thank Sarah Haskins and her staff, Mitzi and Elizabeth and Peter Gann, Michelle Walker, the PA school employees, Shap Smith, for such a well-run and organized meeting last night. It was a quick turnaround, Sarah. I know that you had to do to get everything in order, and you had snacks provided, even at a little bit of a cost, but it helped out some students. And I greatly, greatly appreciate how that all worked out. And I forgot to and the BCA members. So thank you. Um, Eric, any changes to the addition? I mean, yes, please. <laughs> if you would add uh, approved warrants. Okay. And we're going to put that before old business, or where does that usually go? Uh, normally it's after old business. So okay. <coughs> all right. Is that all? All right, thank you. New business, review the LMP for approval. So the local emergency management plan is a document that uh, gets updated annually. Uh, the document itself and the, uh, the pr processes and procedures within it don't change a lot unless we get some sort of a, an update either through Vermont Emergency Management or LCPC. Uh, this year there were no our content changes. The only changes I've made to the plan were name changes, basically different positions of board members added uh, and making those changes. I had uh, two citizens reach out, which was awesome. <coughs> uh, folks are reading it. It's, uh, it's a great document to read if you're getting ready to go to bed. So uh, <laughs> folks read it entirely. Uh, Jamie Brewster pointed out to me that while I had more stone, uh, more so water and light listed, it's an electrical utility. I had neglected to put Vermont Electric Co-op in, and they do have customers in our in our town. So I've added them to the list. Uh, James Westerman contacted me today to let me know that Mud City Kids no longer exist. They've been uh, changed over to a different name, Mass, uh, in conjunction with this other group, are now uh, in that building. So I made those edits, um, and I have an email along for their smaller new foreman at the highway shop. Um, so it's got Lodge's email listed there. So. It's not some of the really small stuff too. It was great. This is a this is a standard uh, process every year. The due date is May first. That's why I incorporated the tonight's special meeting um, because I have this deadline. I had a few things I wanted to ask or change. Um, on page five, it has he or she. Can we put also put in they? It's in the um, part part 4.4. Is it page five of the package form? Yeah, page five of the, um, <coughs> just mine just says page okay. five. 
page five of the uh, report. Um, so in the bottom right corner, you'll see there's a page reference that's for the packet. Oh yeah, it's page four of the. Uh, page four of the packet. Of the packet. Sorry. <coughs> the numbering system within this. This is an older form, an older document, and it has uh, some different attachments. So the numbering scheme is a little askew in it, yeah. but our uh, packet reference is easier. Which uh, which area is you saying? Four point four. It has uh, one, two, three, four. The fifth line down. He or she, and just uh, add the word they. Gotcha. And I was wondering about um, 4.6, it says sheltering and care. Are any churches involved in housing or helping with this possibility? Not, I, not usually. I haven't reached out to any of the churches for that purpose. <coughs> uh, we have our, uh, our places that we typically reach out to. The school, if it's not a uh, utility event, if the power is out, they don't have a generator up there. But they do have the capacity, or large capacity, to have people house the showers and food uh, facilities. Red Cross typically would staff that if it's a large group. <coughs> I've added this year uh, the cooling centers, the, the library, and uh, on occasion if we needed to, I work with the fire chief, and their their classroom is air conditioned as well. So. The library is only during library hours, but it's a place during the hottest times of the day that folks can go and get out of the heat if they need to. I was also wondering on page 1 3, <clears throat> do we? I, I realized after notes to myself that we, the homeless shelter isn't housed here in our town, but would that be part of the uh, uh, group that would be notified? This. <clears throat> Is saying it's listed or it's not? It's listed. not listed. No, so each, every municipality does the same reporting. It's the same reporting requirement uh -huh. by their emergency management director. So that would be a Hyde Park. Hyde Park would have it in their plan. But it's not referenced in ours because it's not, it's not our, uh, it's not our facility. And I had, um, I didn't know if the select board chair in Stowe is Billy Adams. That may have changed. Uh, I know Eric Rogers don't want the chairs. I think the patient saw that. It's one of those changes as well. No, with another one. I think Bob Beeman's name is in here. Um, page 2 dash 2. Ryan Harris. <coughs> yeah. I did read it and I didn't fall asleep. So. Yeah. Is is Paula listed as the assistant finance director? Would that still be her? Would we meet up? Yeah. I don't know if anybody had anything else to add. <coughs> no, I think it has you listed as the assistant chair, Judy. On two yeah, chairs, one. Well. Well. Yeah. 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 It's not four changes. <coughs> That, that's all my notes. So do you need us to approve this, have a motion? If you would make a motion to approve it, and I have a document for you to sign, Judy. Okay, thank you. Eric, it's worth noting that last year, a year ago, this went through a more significant edit. So there is the local emergency management plan, and then there's the local emergency, there's a different one. It's got a different acronym. It's escaping me right now. <laughs> that one's a very five year review. And it's a much broader scope. That's what we did last year. That's what you did last year. We did this one as well, but it was, it's a, it was a quick update. And you gave us new pages for it? I did. Pages one and three are the, those changes that I've made on since that packet went out. But I, I will get you uh, the rest of the changes. I'll reprint this one. Right. Thank you. So do we hear a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the Town of Morristown Local Emergency Management Plan. <coughs> And a second. They did 5 one, 2023. I second that too. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is passed. And on to old business. So we have a presentation, right? So we're taking that right now. But this, it's not on our 
really not on our um, agenda. The library requested some time at the beginning of the meeting to do a presentation. So take it away, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And when you come up, would you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. So while Sarah is pulling that up, my name is Steph Hoffman. I'm treasurer of the Morristown Centennial Library Board of Trustees. With me tonight is Julie, and she is the chair, uh, Julie Pickett. Um, we are an all-volunteer board who runs the Board of Trustees for the library, and the library is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and that impacts part of the presentation, so that'll come up a little bit later. And thank you, Sarah, for the technical assistance tonight with the presentation. You'll have to bear with us if it, if it doesn't function perfectly. <clears throat> so many of the members of the board are, are new or haven't heard me speak yet. Um, I think two of you have. This is our fifth time presenting in the last two years because there's been a lot of change in the library's budgeting needs and how our library is run. And so we've come before you at multiple times to explain in the last two years how that funding dynamic works and what our needs are as a library going forward and what our obligations are as a board in terms of that funding. Most recently, we came during the budget season in December to do a presentation about why our appropriation request had increased so significantly and explaining why that split had changed. I'm here today to explain that, but more in the context of the budget situation that the town is facing in total and recognizing that context. So as an overview, I'd like to explain that um, we are still urging the select board to reconsider the cut that has been proposed for the library. The cut is a $74,000 cut. To put that in context, that is 18% of our overall budget. Um, we cannot continue to operate if 18% of our budget is cut from uh, operation expenses. But more importantly, I want to talk about the positives that our library brings this town and brings the select board and brings the members of this town in terms of value, the need to sustain it as an important and critical town resource and the way it serves our community and how it's doing that economically and efficiently over the last 15 plus years. As I mentioned, the fact that we're a 501c3 um, nonprofit public library has a great benefit to the residents of Morristown. That benefit is that we have an endowment that has existed for 125 years since the library was created. That endowment helps fund approximately over the years 30 to 45 percent of the library's budget. Essentially, it's like signing up for a service, let's use easier numbers, that costs $100 a month and you've got a guaranteed $30 off every single month for the rest of eternity. If we take the funding out of that endowment at a rate that it cannot sustain, which has been part of our ongoing presentations uh, to the select board and to the town over the last two years, that endowment will be used up. At the point where that endowment is used up, two things happen. One, that $30 a month, let's say in the hypothetical I'm using, goes away. And every resident of the town stops experiencing that discount. The second impact is that in all likelihood we'd have to become a municipal library instead of a 501c3 nonprofit. And that means that all of the folks in the library become town employees. For this fiscal year alone, that would represent a 74,000 and change increase just on healthcare and retirement benefits for our employees. So instead of it being $100 a month, it becomes $150 a month and you don't get the $30 off. That is a double, it's almost a 50% increase on the cost to run the library in terms of what the taxpayers of Morristown experience. So we're asking you to reconsider in the context of the library the amount that you're taking out of our budget to preserve the endowment. Tell me what you want to change. Ne yeah, next one, thanks Sarah. So I just want to explain the context of the cut a little bit more for the select board and for the members of Morristown that are here today. We certainly understand that our total appropriation request may not be appropriate this year. And that is something that we are certainly willing to work on. We're willing to try to save money. But to give everyone some important context from the perspective of our budget, there are only five categories in our budget total that we are representing an increase in in this year's budget. Four of those are things that are completely out of the library's control. One, electricity. Everyone's experiencing that, I'm sure, in this room, increasing rate costs. Second, propane. 
Again, I'm sure everyone in this room understands that we cannot control that cost and it's significantly increasing. Third, telephone service. Unfortunately, consolidate, Consolidated has a monopoly and dictates those prices to us, but we need to be able to answer the phones to serve our patrons. Fourth is postage. We provide interlibrary loan services to bring materials from all over the state and all over the country to residents of Morristown who are requesting them. And we participate in that program. We don't control the cost that's set at the state level for that. Those costs have increased. The fifth and only ca other category that we've not just level funded or funded lower than last year is in payroll. Give you some context on it. We are asking that our staff can experience a 5% cost of living increase from their current wages. Our payroll is funding an, incre an incredibly qualified staff. Three of our staff members have advanced degrees, yet our current average wages for our employees are $20.50 an hour. So the cost increase we're asking for is to $21.50 an hour for our staff on average and a range of $18 to $30 an hour for each staff member if you're including every, every um, salary. Where it's possible, the library is able to seek grants to fund other areas of our budget, like materials, programming, and technology. Those grants are not available for payroll costs. They just are not. It's not an operational element that grants are available for for 501c3 nonprofits. We also do significant fundraising as a board, so these are other ways that we provide taxpayers in Morristown a discount on library services. Sarah, next slide, please. <coughs> so this is an important concept that is related back to what I was talking about in terms of the endowments discount. The value that Morristown residents experience on a per capita basis, what each taxpayer pays each year to be able to use all the resources that the library provides is significantly reduced in Morristown because of that endowment. That endowment has basically been providing residents of Morristown a discount since the inception of the library and for the last decade in that 30 to 45% range that I mentioned. However, that discount is not guaranteed. As we showed the select board over the last two years, if we continue to increase the, the um, withdrawals from the endowment account at the same pace as we need to keep up with inflation when we're not earning on that account, at that same rate, we will drain the endowment in the next generation. So we'll essentially be leaving to our children and grandchildren the cost that I was talking about, the 50% increase of running a library to future generations. And so in order to sustain the endowment, we have a policy in place that uses a formula that calculates based on earnings over the last 12 months how much we can withstand, and we propose that each year to the select board in our budget. This year's is a little over $63,000. So that $63,000 is funded entirely from the endowment and does not rely on taxpayers whatsoever. A portion of our budget is also funded via fundraising and from grants. Let's discuss this a little bit with some real numbers on the next slide. This comparison shows similarly sized libraries throughout Vermont with also similarly sized budgets. Sorry, Sarah, could you slide it up just a smidge? It's okay if the title's not there. So you'll see Morristown on the bottom of this this, I will point out, is fiscal year 2021 because the way the library statistics are collected, are those are collected at the beginning of 2022 by April, and the new statistics won't come out for a couple of months, so I couldn't give you 2022 yet. Morristown was, uh, residents were experiencing 32.93 a person. As you can see, the closest library to us on this list is $49.09, and it escalates for towns like Waterbury, 93.99 a person per capita per year, each taxpayer. So the discount that the endowment provides and the other fund, funding sources that we provide is quite substantial. Next slide. And when you consider this in conjunction with the way that Morris, Morristown's library ranks in these statistics, it's quite astounding. First of all, there are only 27 libraries in Vermont that serve a larger population than we do. Yet, 101 libraries are funded at a higher per capita rate than we are. MCL tops the stats for total registered borrowers, total audio materials, total virtual programs, and this year we're probably gonna break the overall programming statistics for other libraries and for total print materials and total overall collection. Essentially, we're providing a wealth 
of materials, information, information technology, programs, services, after school care, tutoring, homelessness assistance, job assistance, and other programming, all for a really, really great value for Morristown residents, and we're such a critical community resource in that respect. So just to reiterate the role of the endowment, it is a private source of funding that receives contributions periodically, but was funded primarily approximately three decades ago and then from the inception, 125 years ago. So over the course of uh, over 100 years, we've been, uh, we've been basically using that fund and the interest that's earned on that fund and the income that's earned on that fund to support a good discount for the Morristown uh, res the residents of Morristown, and the board has to make policies to determine what is an appropriate withdrawal on, that, withdrawal on that each year. That is part of our fiduciary obligation, and we cannot exceed that obligation if our financial advisors tell us this is the appropriate amount. We're bound by that determination by our advisors, and we don't have discretion to over-withdraw from it. So essentially, that doesn't operate as sort of a, a slush fund or something where we can pull money in difficult times, and in fact, our advisors advocate not to do that because we're experiencing the same financial issues that everyone is experiencing right now in terms of earnings on that account and what's available. We've experienced you know, losses in the last year, year and a half on that account. So we have to be very careful to protect those funds. This slide just explains again, and I won't reiterate it too long, the, the fact that because there is an endowment that provides a discount, there's also the fact that we're run as a 501c3, which was the point I made that if we became municipal, we would have to pay our employees under the town's employment policies and provide that sort of panoply of benefits that are available to town employees. And there are other areas of our budget that could be affected as well. And in addition, that does limit the types of grants that are available to the library and the role of the board in terms of fundraising and private funding of the library once it converts. So we lose some of those resources, if not all of them, should that transition need to take place. So I'll just conclude by saying that as a representative of the library here today and understanding I'm also a Morristown resident and I know what's been going on and I've heard everyone's very valid points about where are we supposed to get this money from. We understand that. We understand that everyone's affected. But this critical town resource has experienced all of those same issues. And if we continue to not acknowledge the fact that we need to fund these resources to run a vibrant community full of members who participate in the programs at our library that come together and utilize these resources, then as a town, we, we won't have these resources. They won't be available to us, and we can't continue to operate if we cannot pay our staff and retain them a reasonable wage to live a life in Morristown here as residents as well. So I just thank you so much for this opportunity, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them today. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, the, you referenced your endowment um, getting hit. <clears throat> Is it... Uh, largely be, uh, have an impact because it's the endowment is invested in the stock market so what i'm asking is uh is it potential or that we're going to see a change or are you uh anticipating that this is from here on out is going to be uh needed so our endowment is invested in the stock market very conservatively of course because as endowments are yeah. um and typically in a bond market which is also suffering right now right. That, is, that has short-term impacts, and yeah. certainly, with the losses that we're experiencing. However, we also have experienced sort of average growth that does not keep pace with inflation overall. It's like a 3 to 5% growth. And the way that we determine what we can withdraw from the account isn't just like a retirement account. It's based on the income that the account generates and not the interest. So what I mean by that is each month, there's a certain amount of money that is determined to have been income generated on the account from things like sell it, the ability to sell the various investments at a certain price. And that income amount is what we're, we base our calculation off of in terms of what we can invest. And so it is just a more conservative profile. And, and the fluctuations in the market affect what is available. But also, we have to keep a mi our mind's eye on the fact that the investment potential there is lower than inflation has been. 
So we're looking at the certainly for the next five years that this is going to be an issue. I would say that the formula we're using to determine the investment amount helps shoulder what is appropriate, helps determine what is appropriate. Right. So that formula will fluctuate. There'll be years where that number is not 63,000, it's 75,000. And as time goes on and the account hopefully continues to mature in a positive direction, that number would hope hopefully escalate with time as well. It's just that the percentage of the overall budget needs to be ramped down because over time it's ramped up. Yeah, out of balance. Yes. Anyone else on the board have questions? Um, I, I have a question for Tina. Um, from the original budget. Mm -hmm. that we, Which original budget? <laughs> the original one back in January that was originally born. Mm -hmm. we, we cut that library funding by 74 since then. Is that correct? Since then, you directed me to make cuts to bring the... the um, increased down to 14% and that's when this happened. I just cut it to uh, reflect the increase in our operations, which may not be appropriate, I don't know. I just just did what you had asked. And 74,000 represents about a, approximately a 1% increase? That's right. A little bit less? A little bit, a little more. bit more because, yeah. May I make one clarification about that too? That's important to understand. Our actual budget request increase was 10.8%. The reason that the appropriation request is more significant than that is because of this rebalancing that needs to happen with the endowment. So last year we were level funded in terms of appropriation. Taking that into account, if we had received a 5 to 8% increase, then that overall increase of 74000 would have been cut by about 36. So it's really something that we're trying to rebalance the town's appropriation towards the library's funding at the same time that we're asking for a 10.8% increase, which we understand is greater than typical um, for the overall budget amount that the library is requesting, just to clarify that difference. Does that make sense? It does. So can I ask one more question? Sure. So if we just suppose, I don't know what the will of the board is here, um, if we didn't put 74000 back in or didn't put it all back in or didn't put some part of it back in, that would come from payroll? At this Give point, your five areas. it's the largest area of our budget. It's about a little under two-thirds of our budget is payroll. My, I'm imagining you can't do much with the four utilities that you... <clears throat> They're all monopolies and we don't have negotiating possibilities. And USPS is a monopoly somewhat too, at least in running ILL. Um, I don't think there's any question that uh, any library in any town in Northfield is no different, that it is a significant community resource on many levels. And um, as I went through um, the worksheet um, that I asked for, because, um, because of the significant cut that was originally proposed to your budget, um, you know, it certainly is evident that you, know, you are looking for about a 10% increase. Um, and as I looked at your payroll um, benefits, you, you know, uh, this past year it was $243,000 and change, and now you're asking for two ninety nine. dollars um, are you adding any staff to that, or is it the difference between what was last year and what's this year um, just the 5% uh, that, you're, that you're adjusting your uh, pay raises to the FICA match, the 7.65% FICA match that's included in there, and any other retirement benefit changes? Is there anything else that I'm missing in terms of what the difference is? So the only thing you're missing there is the contribution to unemployment insurance, which also is a percentage of the wage so that you're paying your employees. Yes, yeah. imposed by the state and federal government. We have a three, up to 3% match on our retirement plan. That's what we offer our employees. And I believe all but two are enrolled in that. So four employees are enrolled in that plan. Okay. So those specific items basically of the difference between the appropriation last year and what you're looking for this year. Yes. Okay, you're not adding staff or anything. We are not adding staff. Okay. And, uh, and the town is, has assumed, I guess, uh, based on worksheet, 
Last year, you were obligated to 51,000 for building and grounds, and this year, it's about a 20. $20,000 difference, the town owns the building, and we've assumed more responsibility moving forward, so there's some savings there in terms of what the town is, is obligated to. Um, a couple things, I guess, I would request. Um, one is um, because taxpayers spending money um, on any entity, whether it's a library or something else, but since you're a nonprofit and we have this sort of uh, relationship because of that. Um, would it be um, okay with you if the town received a copy of your investment policy? Just so that our fiduciary responsibility when we're investing almost $300,000 in it, that we would understand what what your policy says, whether you, you know, as you bring money in for capital gain, what you're allowed to take out, just as a shared document or disclosure, you know, transparency between the library and the town. Sure. Can you just clarify, are you asking for the board's endowment policy in terms of how we calculate, or are you asking for a reporting on the um, per performance of the account? Because we do provide that annually. We're part of the town's audit process. Right. And, I, and I looked at that audit this, the past two years, actually, and I see where that's disclosed. But I guess um, what I'm asking for is the, the board's investment policy for that endowment. So we have no problem sharing our yeah, endowment I mean, policy? I mean, it was just, I, I don't know as it was ever done in the past. I just thought it might be a good idea just for that purpose. It, it's a new, it's a new um, document. Right. It's, yeah. a, it's in the last year and a half. Right. So we have no problem sharing that. In, in the past, just out of curiosity, um, were you drawing down principal as well as, as interest to sustain the library? And that's what propagated the, the change in, the, uh, in creating an investment policy? Yes, for eight years we were overdrawing on what was recommended from our income okay. on the account. All right. Yeah, those, those are the only questions. Um, I too, you know, asked Tina, you know, if we move forward with your request, um, as, as asked um, what that would reflect on on our um, overall budget and it does add just about a percent increase to that and we do understand that we may not receive the the full 74,000 we're just here to ask for any any accommodation that the board thinks is appropriate and if anything else we're here to educate and how have people understand where we're coming from and who this really affects. Our employees do not make a significant amount of money and would be asking them to work in a job that they love, but for not enough money potentially to survive and that affects retention of some really excellent people. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. Yes, we all are. Is your budget available online anywhere? Um, we don't push, put our budget on our website, but we okay. pr provide it to the town as part of the budgeting process, so it's in the town. Yeah, town's materials. Would it, would it have been in the town report? No. No? No, I don't believe so. Okay. There's a letter in the town report. It's not our budget. I have a copy of it if you want to see it. All right. I don't think it's in your books. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I just wanted uh, one quick mention. <clears throat> For anyone who has solar, if you don't know this, if you have any credits that are going to expire, you can donate them to the library, and it would pay the, help pay their electric bill. So if you're a Morris goes, town, if you're a Morrisville light and electric customer, yes, that's what we are. Yes, yes. Yes. So just spread the word because rather otherwise it just <clears throat> you lose it after a year. So you can donate it um, even if it's twenty dollars a month to help the library. Thank you. Anyone else on the board? Okay. okay. Um, we have a question from there. Do you want to stand up and introduce yes, yourself, um, please? So uh, I'm directing this to the lady from the library. Uh, it may have been answered. Is it Lowenton, Morristown, et cetera? Uh, I think it may just have been answered. Actually, you asked some very detailed questions about the endowment and, and how that's used. Um, so I'm going to ask a side question. Could everybody please speak really clearly? It must be my age. I don't pick everything up and it helps to read lips sometimes, not that I necessarily want you to take your mask off. So I try to pick up the details of this and sometimes it's difficult. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, an investing question. You were saying that 
uh, your endowment is not performing as well as it may have done in the past, if I am correct in what I heard. And, and it would be nice if it, the endowment could help out better, but it's not right now. Um, my question is, do you draw down for income from that endowment uh, um, realized capital gains or only uh, interest and dividends? So we, we don't actually draw on the interest either. We draw on the income that is assigned to each month's uh, sale of various stocks and bonds okay. in the account. So that, and that's answering my questions. You, <clears throat> you realize capital gains, which can have some nasty fluctuations as the economy goes up and down, as you're saying. Um, all right, I won't address I was just getting information. I would have something to say about that, but it's not appropriate at the moment because of the level of detail. So thank you. But it's best if you don't ever have to sell anything, as many of us know. Someone else step up, please. <laughs> yeah, Bob Bortry. I live in Morrisville. Um, I was shocked when I saw that the library was not funded and River Arts as well. Um, these are gems to our community. This is what makes our community livable. And if we <coughs> let this go away, what next? What goes away next? We can't do this. We have to support these organizations. So I plead with the select board to please reconsider funding these two wonderful organizations. They are worthy of it. Thank you. I don't believe the River Arts funding was a board decision, right? That was a Correct. vote on appropriation. Yeah. You're aware of that, right, Bob? I, I am. Yeah. It's just shocking. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I, would, I would like to add to Bob's. Please in introduce My yourself. My name is Tom Puglia. And forgive me for my voice. But I, I would like to add what, to Bob what he says. I had handed you out something uh, on a little bit of what these people do on a weekend. And they, you talk about your rec department, but they do it all year long with these kids that show, showing up at that library for adults. And every time you go in there, you see tons of people that are using their services. And, and they're, I mean, they're vital to this town. And, and to cut them like that and then lose it to, to, to uh, the municipal library would be, would be tragic. It would be just tragic. So I, I just implore you, and say, well, just, just not do that to this wonderful institution. <clears throat> yeah, hello, my name is uh, Scott Thompson. I'd just like to stay. I used to work at the state hospital as a top psychiatrist in the state. Books, education um, is very, very important to community Pell Grants, getting into UVM with uh, 3.75 or better, helping out with your tuition for the uh, little kids and, the, you know, all these alcohol and drugs that have been passing around the town. Libraries open. Maybe they can go waste, you know, go there and have some educational moments. Maybe those educational mom moments they could step into UVM with uh, Dr. Simpatico, who, like I said, he's now one of the big dogs of UVM, Chicago State University, high honored med grad. He'd love to see a library in every town. And I've worked with him at the old state hospital, and I still work with him at a vision of NAMI. I feel for the uh, youngsters and just having a place like that for educational um, access. Being a computer's there, I would more than support it. I'm the Department of Mental Health, um, the University of Vermont, and Dr. Tom Sepatico, I'm sure he would back me up 110%. It's educational, and that's what the kids need in this town. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else have their hand up in the back? Yes, my name's uh, Dave Campbell, and the young lady, you did a very fine job. And on your expenses, do you get the town price for fuel, for propane and oil? Yes. <laughs> okay, and I assume you, the town buys their fuel from, they put it out on, on, bid. on bid every year with the company. Okay. 
Anyone else? Dennis Smith from here in town. Um, I went to that library 60 years ago, pick up a book, go back out. Well, this year I had a chance to go with my granddaughters to some of the programs. I couldn't believe what goes on in that library. Just constant programs for not only the kids, but for adults. Uh, it's unbelievable. I wondered why there were so many people, so many staff there. They're all busy. They're all helping people. They're, it's a wonderful, wonderful group. Uh, I heartily support our library. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Well, I, I my name is Nancy Banks, um, and um, so uh, speaking more generally about because I'm sure you're going to hear from a lot of other people tonight about how important other requests that were made to the board are, and how difficult this is. But I guess I look at this bigger picture, and I think we're looking at what a 13, 14 percent increase. I forget what the number is. I looked at the packet today. And you're going to the taxpayers and you're going to say, we need an increase of 14%. And by the way, that includes a big cut to your library. And I'm thinking, wait a second, there's something wrong with this picture. Um, so when I look at where we are, and I know everybody sitting here has worked so hard, but I think we've lost sight of what is it that Morrisville can really afford? And so before we start adding a lot of new things that are in this budget, we really need to look back, we need to sit back and say, what is the size of government that Morrisville can afford? And are we gonna start slashing some of these gems in the house to expand the size? And I look at what you're doing, what's been proposed, and basically, you've cut a lot of stuff that's just kicking it down the road to next year. So we're going to be sitting at this table next year, and we're all going to feel just as frustrated because the increases, because all that maintenance is probably going to cost more money, and we've now increased the size of the staff. And quite frankly, the cost of living is not going down, so we're probably going to be faced with another saying, well, we have to give our salaries to employees. We need to pull back and say, what is a reasonable size of government that we can afford here before we start adding a lot of stuff? And I would urge you, you've got some really talented citizens here, perhaps form a finance committee to look at and say, you've got this development in the pipeline. We know how much tax revenues. So let's begin to think about what is a reasonable size so we can produce a tax rate for Morrisville that's a livable tax rate for all the residents. You know, we can form a citizens committee to look at sidewalks and help prioritize. You'd be amazed what a group of really committed citizens. So I'm offering to volunteer to sit on one of those, but I urge you to look at the bigger picture because Approving a budget that includes a cut like this is just devastating to this community. Right. And I don't think is in our long-term interest. And, and I, 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 mean, I, I personally don't disagree with that. And um, the adjustment that you saw on the new worksheet that's basically the new budget overview, uh, that 14% includes fully funding the library, just, just so you know from there. So we, we pared this down um, utilizing some reserve money um, that uh, sits in a reserve account. We can talk about, or we want to talk about that tonight. Um, and a little over a 2% increase in the growth of the grand list. And what that, what did that, what that needed down to was about a, 10% overall increase in taxes. And, and I really want to move tonight's conversation away from percentages, away from percentages to what that really translated, translates into dollars and cents and how that affects a wide range of uh, home values so that you can really see what kind of effect that it's going to have on your taxes. Because as I said to the last meeting, 10%, 14% doesn't mean a thing to me. We're really what you want to know is how it's going to 
affect your bottom line with your tax bill. So with all of that being said, um, before the growth in the grand list, uh, we were at 13%. You know, putting fully funding the library brings us to 14%, but when you add in the growth of the grand list, this brings us down to just about 11% increase. And we've run the data, and there's a, information available to you that shows the dollars and cents impact on $75,000 property, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500,000, so that you can see, um, and this is just the municipal side of the ledger, um, what that effect is going to have on your home when you get your tax bill. Does, does that does that help at all? It does, but you know, Morrisville is still one of the highest tax towns around, and which makes to me, not a whole lot of sense, because we have a good mix of industry and residential and commercial. We should be a really, we shouldn't be in that position. And I just get concerned that we're just a 10%, and I know this has been a high cost year, so perhaps, but we're building in a lot of costs that we're gonna have to carry in this town for a long time, and that's what really concerns me. And I would <coughs> love to, I guess I would recommend we hold the line as much as we can and some of the new till we really can sort of right size what is the reasonable size of what a budget should be for what our community needs, because I really don't think with all due respect, I know how hard you have worked, but I just don't think we've been able to, we've created the forms to have the citizen input that we need, and perhaps there's other ways of doing that. And I'm hoping as the discussion goes through tonight, where we really sort of dig down into what we're trying to achieve here, that at the end of the night, uh, we won't agree to disagree, we can all agree um, that the board and the administrative staff has done their due diligence on trying to hold the line. And I personally don't disagree with the fact that that at the 30% level, that was including a whole host of things that sh should be addressed. It was sort of a wish list, I think, overall. What we're really talking about is basic operations here, but it's incumbent not only on this board, but the boards that succeed us is to really take a look and prioritize. And, and we have the staff here. I mean, we have the brain power between all of our departments and the administration here to do the sidewalk analysis, take a look at all the pavement projects and the equipment re uh, replacements and repairs, and, and drill, you know, come up with a, a reasonable plan that the taxpayers can understand and support, not only this year, but in the years moving forward. Is that? Five cents worth of my opinion for free. Thank you. I know that we have um, had some presentations that were going to be happening. I'm wondering, like, okay, there's somebody on the phone. Before, Ed, did you want to ask another question about the library? Well, it's about not only the library, but this special, um, all of the. Um, Things that got broken out for the first time in quite a while, you know, do we want to contribute a certain amount to this organization, that organization? And I was kind of shocked at the ones that did not get approved. I voted for most of them, not all of them. And what I'm hearing now, and I've been seeing through the whole process, is that if communication could be improved generally, so that the people who have to eventually have to vote yes or no could truly understand it in a way that was meaningful, it was accurate, was presented in a coherent fashion, I think a lot of the difficulties we'd be having aren't, wouldn't be here. Um, one thing I'd like to consider doing is helping all of these like river arts. How do we not fund a basic part of the community? How do we not fund the library? is that if that were broken out separately so it didn't look like the main 10 whatever in percent, 28 percent in the, in, the, in the basic general budget, I think people would have a chance to select those amenities of the town and feel that they were invested in them and would have much of, less of a problem paying a few extra dollars out of their tax budget, but it's the way it's presented. 
the guy yesterday with his sidewalks, Josh Goldstein, and I told him, you know, you're going to lose this and you had a second vote and you're never going to see this again. Um, if you, I can help with that. Let me just put it that way. Thank you, Ed. It's, it's a skill. Thank you. Well, and the other thing about going back to River Arts, that was an appropriation, so that wasn't part of the our budget. I and know. We had nothing to do with it being voted down. I, Unfortunately, you, you're saying that that was one of the appropriations. Yes. Well, and I'm suggesting that if we give some help to the ones that we feel are have long been an essential part of the town function, and all the to explain how this would work for them. All of the information about the appropriations was in the town report. People came in to vote, and they didn't know what they were voting on because yes. they didn't look at the town report. And that's why I'm saying you can't just, it, it, more has to be done because you're going to get that every time. The, the I, I, I'm agreeing with you, and I think that process is something we need to work on. It isn't something we can work go. on right now, but no, it is something we can work that, on. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that we need to start turning this discussion in a, on a bulk kind of scale into how we communicate with the voters who will have to say yes or no. I agree. It's, it's, it's not going to happen tonight. Everywhere. I'm seeing that right. everywhere. So anyone else wants to speak about the library? No. There's somebody uh, there. Um, Joanne? I was just wondering if the um, town is willing to look at their budget again to allow for some of the library to go through so that we can fund at least partially the library and maybe the town can find that savings again in their budget. Could, uh, did everybody understand that? No. I, didn't, I didn't totally understand that. Could you speak a little louder? Okay. Um, uh, my question is, is the town willing to somebody at the town level chose to take the library out of the funding, that they add at least part of it back in and look again at their budget to see if they could find the savings to cover that somewhere else? I think we've been talking, um, Chris and Don have been talking about 1% uh, coming back in, which is what the library is asking for. Is that answering your no. question? And where is that going to come from out of the town's budget? We put in, um, I think, 200 and... Judy, if I can interrupt you, I okay. think the, the concept here <clears throat> is she's asking for us to look at the budget to be cut in an equal, equal amount to what gets put back into the library's budget. Yeah. I think that's what her request oh, is. Oh, she wants us Correct. to cut 1% someplace else. Correct. Correct. Oh. Yep. I'm not sure if she's seen this document here that helps... Ooh. I think that's something oh, that Sarah is going to right share. Now. We're kind well, of that's like, helpful, yeah. though, I think, in this conversation. Yeah. I think we're kind of jumping all over when to try to stay with the library and kind of finish that discussion if we I could. I just mean this directly. No, no, I, I know. I, well. Yeah. So Sarah, I'm, I'm trying. Sarah's trying to get a document up on the screen so you can see it, hopefully at home. I think the people here have access to it. Just for the this is just does not include school budget. One second. It's the total town increase. It's just the increase. I find my paperwork. Go ahead. Come on up. David Ring, I want to refer real quickly to this. Because we, we're gonna let's just stick with this uh, well, right now. But the, but the library budget is it buried somewhere in the general fund revenue? I don't know where the library fund would fit in here or does fit in because it's got to fit in here somewhere. It's, it's got to be here somewhere. But I'd like to know where. It's under general government. Okay. And, uh, I just have it up here now. I don't. If we're gonna discuss this and we're gonna discuss the library, we'll be buried in here. So I think they're both appropriate to know where it is. Right. Because essentially, you've gone through here and you've, we've whacked out certain items, but nowhere do I see you've changed, because I don't know where the library is. I'd like to see where that comes in. You didn't, you didn't show it anywhere, but you've chopped out all the other ones out of here. 
It's in the general government okay. line item. That's it. Thank you. Sarah, do you have another copy of this? Sure. Thank you. I can't I can't see that very well from there. So what we have in front of us, did you want to say something about this? You want me to try to talk about it? It was a pretty self-explanatory thing. Um, sorry, I honestly have not been listening because I've been doing Zoom. Yeah, I know. That's why it's hard to take minutes and do Zoom. Um, this is based on um, the revised budget that Tina created, and then Tina gave me the increased tax rate that that would be applying the 2% grand list growth that the town assessor is estimating that we will have to, to get that new tax rate. So um, the top, I can't see it on there either. The top, the top one um, is if the library's <laughs> full request is added back in. And so if you have a house of 200, that that's worth 200,000 it um, with the budget increase that um, was proposed of 14.1 including the library it would be your tax it would would be increased by two hundred and thirty five dollars and forty cents for the year if the the if your house is valued five hundred thousand your taxes would increase approximately five hundred eighty eight dollars and fifty cents the second column in there of the budget increase that's, that was proposed in the packet, uh, reducing the library, if your house value was 200,000, it would be an increase of 213,080 cents. If your house is valued 500,000, it would be an increase of $534.50. So the difference is basically 1%. It's about a penny on the tax rate we're talking. So the difference between including the library and not, if your house is valued 200,000, is $21.60. We're talking a couple dollars a month to fund the library at that much. Um, if your house is worth 500,000, it's $54 for the year. That's so, what we're. Sarah, was one a question. Um, the full request in the library, is that the request that's being made tonight or the request that was made back in January? Tina, question. So the, the request, this is funding them as they requested with the original everything the same. From a while ago. Yeah, this is their original <laughs> okay. request. So right, what is thanks. this 299? That's their original request. Original request. Okay. I do, I just want to say and this probably isn't going to be a popular statement i don't see it as cutting the library requests we're, we're proposing a 20 percent increase to the prior fiscal year request from the library i just want to put that out there okay thank you and so the the middle section of this um document is the request the reduced request which is what the seventy four thousand dollars is that correct then Yes, okay. that, that was the proposed cut. All right. So that's how much of an increase over last year is that? Do you have twenty percent and that one's I believe sixty percent. Say that well. So the the second one is a twenty um, the at thirteen percent equals ten point seven. That is a twenty percent increase over their request last year. And the top is a 60% increase over last year. So again, they're requesting more because of their endowment issues. But so, because we're just trying to get our terms straight because we keep saying we're cutting when in fact we're increasing, it's just how much are we increasing? Correct. So I, we just want to get our terminology correct here. So uh, get the, we want to go positive. <laughs> so that's all, okay? It's important to <clears throat> keep yes. track of. Yes, because we get lost. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, in our packet, we have this black and white copy. So we should disregard that packet, that information, because 
this is what we should be looking at. Yeah, so the yeah. one that's in the packet okay. is the the middle, the middle one. Okay. So this so the those figures are valid All right. as one proposal. This just gives you the option if you wanted to add the right. full library Great. request back. Thank in. you. Thank you. Yeah, this That's is right. just so this is just saying that five hundred and eighty your your town taxes will go up five hundred and eighty eight fifty cents. So it doesn't Jamie, include whatever Jamie, the increase Jamie. is. Yeah. But, but people, people home, yeah. people no, home, okay. people home can't hear you. So so Jamie Brewster was asking if the, the figures I just shared were just about the town or if it included the school. These are just figures on the town. I don't have any school rates. School's eight percent. I believe the school. I, I haven't done any calc. We're only focusing on the town budget. I haven't honestly done school calculations. Yeah. 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 Real quick, Lauren, read to recap that, what you're saying is this one was 60% and this was 20%? Correct. Over last year. Correct. Correct. Thank you. 60 or 16? 60. 60 is the top one. And 20% increase over their request <clears throat> from last year. I, I think it's fair to keep in mind, though, that the only reason that the library is coming to yeah. the only reason that the library is coming to us with this uh, request is the fact that what they've historically been dependent on for income from their endowment um, hasn't been able to produce what it has in the past. And rather than to dip into principal to make up that difference, they're coming to the municipality and ultimately to the taxpayers to say, for us to continue to operate in the manner that we've operated and not cut staff and not cut programs, that this is the ask. And um, you can adjust the numbers however you want to. Um, it's a 10% increase in their overall budget uh, request. And it's up to the board to recommend and the taxpayers to uh, approve um, fully funding the library based on the numbers that are available to us. And Steph, just to reiterate, you had mentioned earlier that for eight years you've been dipping into the principal on this endowment. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this really is a long-term sustainability move as opposed to a Band-Aid. So I think that's important to understand too. Is yeah. we're talking long-term sustainability of the library. But could we have could we have mitigated this sixty percent increase if we had taken action eight years ago? Yes. But could you reiterate that, point. please? Had we taken action eight years ago when the endowment was being dipped into, we could have mitigated the the magnitude of this one-time increase. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, Tony, Cody, Cody Hill. I think we had to fund the budget, I mean the library, just like it was, 100%. The library needs this money, and I think we had to go after, it's time we go after positions in this town. I think it's way overstaffed, and I think it's, and I think it's way over, the wages are way over, are way over uh, jealous. And it's time that we look in different areas to cut. We need to cut. We need to get around 10% for the budget. I think this might be a good time to have Paula come up. Paula? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I would guess it would come back up again as we talk budget, but. <laughs> are, you on, are you on speed dial, Stephanie? Sorry, I'm not trying to get close. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Right, thank you. Yes, I think so, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Sorry, Paula. No, it's okay. So, Paula's, go ahead. Um, I'm going to try and speak as clearly as I can. I'm quite sick. So Paula Beatty, HR Director. Um, I just want to start by um, answering a couple of questions that were asked actually at the last meeting. There was a gentleman that asked about our workers' comp experience rate. So I just wanted to uh, answer that it is um, 1.15 and that is from 2019 through 2021. Um, I do see that. Um, reducing and, and monitoring those um, claims that have been
Um, <clears throat> I did not invite him to this meeting um, because the focus was the budget. So um, the intent is for him to come to the next meeting. Um, at the last meeting, I was requested to get some payroll um, information and do some comparisons. So I used VLCT's compensation and benefit um, as my data point. Um, I don't know. Oh, it is up there. Um, <clears throat> and so in doing so, um, I've used the 2022 VLCT's um, data and compared it to the 2022 um, pay rates for the town of Morristown. Um, there's a couple of points, I guess. I'll start at the top, and it's the town administrator's position. Um, with the towns that have submitted their data to VLCT, um, there was only one other town that had a population of 5,000 or more, and that was Swanton for the town administrator's pay rates. So I um, opted to use the town manager's pay rates, um, reviewing um, a population of 3,000 to 7,000. Um, and you can see on the far left corner, that is the current pay rates for our staff. And then in the second column over is the VLCT's average. And then <clears throat> where I could, um, I use VLCT's median. And then in the far um, right corner or right columns um, is the difference between what our staff is being paid and the data that was collected from VLCT. So um, I'm going to just go down it and then we can address questions thereafter. Um, so the town administrator, you can see his pay rate and the data that I used and the difference um, showed that he was actually underpaid for um, based on the VLCT data. And then the administrative assistant, who is the town administrator's assistant, um, using VLCT's data, there were a number of assistant positions going from payroll to payables. So it was a very difficult um, position to um, use the LCT data points. Um, and we've identified that that position should actually be an executive assistant position um, versus an administrative assistant position, um, which would be a very different set of qualifications. Finance director is in the next section. Um, and you'll see her current rate. You'll see the average and median from VLCT, and then a difference of an average of five, she's paid less than $5.37 on average, and um, the median is $5.42, and that's based on, again, um, municipalities across the state of Vermont and the data that is submitted to VLCT. <coughs> the assistant finance director makes $25 an hour, um, she is fairly in line with where she should be. Um, the town clerk's treasurer, assistant town clerk treasurer, um, administrative assistants, they were slightly over. Um, again, I did the calculation on a population of 3,000 to 7,000, because many of the towns are small, so they only have part-time um, clerks or clerks and treasurers. But again, you know, it's, we have to look at the qualifications in our town clerks. Um, it supersedes Sarah Haskins has a number of certifications that don't exist um, by other town clerks. Um, and then the human resources director position, you can see what I make. And then um, doing the average, it's $5 less than the average and $7 less than the median. Planning and zoning director, he makes $28.86 an hour. The average and the median, there's a difference of him being underpaid by $13, and a median of $14.57. Our listing coordinator, she makes $20.41, and she is underpaid by $4.15 on average, and median $4.38. Community coordinator, um, she's paid $27.90, and based on the average and median, she is average two dollars and twenty-one cents on the day, and the median difference of a dollar and twenty-two cents on the day. Our recreation coordinator, who makes twenty-three thirty-seven an hour, looking at the average and median, she's a dollar thirty-five average on the day, and a dollar and one cents on the median. 
Do, just out of time, uh, do we really need to do a line item? Is no. everybody comfortable reading this? I mean, not just cut you off, but I just. Does anybody have a copy? Oh, people don't have copies. Yeah, I have extra copies over there. They're supposed to be in the packet. I think it would help. I, I just want to clarify. Uh, the, t the town administrator, the side note says that uh, the Swanton is the only town with a population of more than 5,000 that has a town administrator, which means that they have the town that submitted data to the LCT. Right. Yeah. So this five fifty one dollar and seventeen cents is actually a manager rate, not an administrator rate. That is correct. So that's, yeah, that's... It's there's totally different positions. Yeah, I, I, I would question that. Did you also look at total pay compensation. I go into total cost to town, uh, which I think is important with, you know, how what are what are their pension plans? The that I did was the hourly rate, the information that is in there now, because um, honestly, I have time to get into yeah. that next layer. Um, the meeting, this meeting was on definitely, and I was... Yeah, that's okay. I'm not faulting you, honey. I'm just trying to get some, um, because again, I... Uh, insurance and pensions can drastically change the value of a job. You can pay less when you're getting. So it, for me, um, it's hard to analyze this when I'm not getting total, you know, again, I look at what the total cost to the town is, um, is, is the data that's important. And I'm not following you at all. The LCT does not, you know, it doesn't yeah. say, so when you're looking at, I, I know Stowe is considered a little different, but it doesn't, when you're looking at the data, it doesn't say that their finance director has a family plan and has, yeah. it, it doesn't give that data. So that yeah. is, that's very difficult data I, to, I understand to build that. down on. Yeah. Um, it'd be like looking at my position. I don't take the town benefits, um, so, the comparison to what the HR director and so she may take the benefits there. Yeah. So to do a comparison on benefits is very. very You've got to compare apples to apples. You got to like assume two person plan across the board or something like that to yeah, get some semblance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's yeah. a whole another layer is, than yeah. looking at okay. an hour. Yeah, I just I just want to be clear about you know. Okay, excuse me. Excuse me. What about and the uh, reason why I use the town administrator um, is because. When you're looking at, and I did look at some job descriptions um, regarding a town administrator versus a town manager, and the, the job duties that are being performed by our town administrator really do follow a town manager's job description. So I'm going to stick by the data that I use, and I feel pretty solid as to why I use that data. Yeah. What about years of service and position? Is that factor? That is in actually here? something that um, there is years of service. I did not drill down that far on the travel because that's a, okay. again it's a whole other layer. It is. But it could be I came here, I've been in the human resources yeah. position, I'll use myself. Yeah. Human resources position. Mm -hmm. I would actually I'm having a hard time speaking. Yeah, it's a little I'm loud. Sick, so yeah. and, um, I'm trying to speak over people. Um, Thank you. I have done <laughs> HR and finance for 29 years. Mm -hmm. I've done it here for the town. Yeah. So to look at that data and DLCT, again, it's I'm, I'm making a judgment call there to say, yeah. you know, if I was looking at your position, you've been at that six, six years, mm -hmm. but I don't know how long you've done it besides, you know, outside of that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't use that, that data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for nothing good data, I would like to just speak to the police department. Um, they are uh, they um, have recently gone through a uh, union negotiation, and um, we have hold been on, able hold to, on, Paul. Okay, thanks. We've good. been able to attract high quality, high performing police officers because of the negotiation process and the adjustments that were made to those salaries. Where we have other positions, like the highway department, where our average hourly rate is $23.37, and we have been, it's been very difficult to fill that position. We had a very strong candidate last year that refused our offer of employment because he was making $3 more. So that is an area that 
there are areas that we would, if we had to replace these employees at what our current pay scale is, it would be very difficult to replace it. And we have people who are educated, knowledge, um, and have been doing this for years. And that is, again, like I said at the last meeting, you start replacing these individuals, you are paying to train. You are not paying for performance. And other than that, that's the data that I had time to pull together. I work very diligently with this. Um, and we greatly appreciate it. We yeah, if there's yeah. more um, depth, I'm happy to do it. I just do not have the time. No, we appreciate it. It's a lot to go through. It is a lot. Thank you, Paul. And I, I know that uh, I saw in the paper that Stowe is asking for uh, people to work for their summer rec program. This would just be a summer job for $20 an hour. That's, that's so, correct. yeah got to yes. put this all into perspective. And what we will be offering um, to the summer counselors is well below that. Three or four dollars an hour. So again, you're gonna you're, you're gonna pay for pay for you know, if you get a product, you want to quality, so yes. you pay for it. If you want quality employees, you have to pay for it. Does it, did you does anybody want to say anything from the board? I, I asked my question. The only thing that I would mention. Up to the microphone. Yeah, more. The only thing that I would mention is that the real difference between a town administrator and a town uh, manager um, is the fact that there's a firewall between the select board and the manager um, in terms of the ability to hire and fire. And that's probably one of the most the biggest difference. The only really significant difference between what a town administrator does and what a town manager does. And, you know, in Waterbury, they just, their manager retired after 33 years. I was on the board that hired him. And uh, we were really fortunate to have him with us for as long as he did. Um, but they just hired a manager. He was the finance director. So no, no town manager experience um, seemed very qualified eight years as a director of finance for St. Albans City, um, his starting salary is $115,000 and it's a full benefit package. You know, as far as Morristown's um, town administrator, um, we're fortunate um, that um, Eric um, is, you know, his, his wages are his wages, but he's opted not to take the, the benefit package in terms of health insurance. Am I correct there? Correct. Um, rather, he t gets a stipend back uh, in recognition of that, but there's a big difference between what his health insurance could be for somebody else who came in here and what Eric is, is claiming. The other benefit that he gets is a $200 car stipend a, uh, a month to use his vehicle for town <coughs> business. He gets a $50 phone allowance for the use of his personal cell phone. So that's, you know, in terms of those other benefits that Laura was talking about, potentially um, Morristown is actually quite fortunate in that respect. Go ahead. <coughs> so here's the biggie. For Come and introduce yourself again. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <coughs> People do forget. Uh, this is Ed Lowenton, uh, Morristown. So this morning, uh, actually much of the day, this was great, by the way. This, this, this was what I spent some time doing from other sources today. So I have this to pass out, and I would like to quickly go through it and... Homework? Yeah. Homework. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you're idle. Thank you. Okay, so Paul is saying there's copies of the uh, work that she did if you'd like it. Right. So I looked at a couple of things today. One uh, is the, uh, just what that uh, person did just now. Uh, but from a variety of dis different sources and in nowhere near as disciplined as fashion, uh, disciplined as fashion. Um, and uh, where I uh, start with section one, salary comps and inflation. Uh, I'm saying the claims made are current pay scales not competitive. 
So I thought, well, let me go look around. And what I found, um, I took it from a variety of more or less credible sources here are recruiting firms, and one is an actual job offer from the town of Milton. So they're, I mean, that's got to be real because that's the pay that they're actually offering. Um, I'm going to put this on a website uh, tonight or tomorrow morning and put the URL on front page forum so that everybody who's interested can find their way to it. Um, so this is from a variety of sources. I won't go through the numbers to take up everybody's time, but you'll all be able to get to see them as we go on. Um, and it didn't quite comport with uh, her numbers. They're from different sources. Uh, that suggests we're not necessarily uncompetitive <coughs> with our current rates of pay. It varies plus here and minus there. Uh, but the general trend of the numbers I found is that we're doing okay in terms of absolute pay. Uh, benefits is an another thing which makes the whole picture very complicated. And by the way, I started a new view. How do you present information? If I was costing a product, I would want to see total cost of my item. So that's where I headed to. It's a long way to populate it. I hope if somebody wants to get this live and do it for me, I'd be happy to do that, please. Um, so cost of living increases. Um, last year's rate of inflation was a 20 or more year record. It really went pretty wild, and a lot of that was from the surplus spending from COVID over the years of, of, of federal supplementation. That's well on its way down. Uh, rate of inflation for this year is estimated at 4 to 6 percent, considerably below the 8.7, which was the general consensus for 2022. Um, so it's not true that it just goes up. The rate of it going up doesn't always go up. So these cost of living increases um, that we're aiming at right now may going in, since we're going into a recession, I hate to tell everybody, um, this may not suit us going forward necessarily. So I have some detail pulled through things where we might be looking at some really legitimate pay hikes of a little bit here and there, is at the bottom wage scale of the employees that the town hires. I provided a link to the MIT cost of living index. They do one, a very thorough analysis for every county in the United States, including us. And you'd be surprised how much it costs to live in this town for a single person. All right. So, Ed, we, uh, we have a copy of this, and we can look at this well, a little bit later. This is a public forum. And yes, and we do, have, just, we, do have a, we do have quite a business we have I to, to take to care of. Getting the How about, can you, we'll give you another minute to uh, present. There's some, there's some serious material here. Yes, please so finish up in a minute. Considerably research. I don't see why the problem is, well, at least going through this briefly. But here's the main point that I've made to a couple of the members of the board uh, individually. Um, the claim is made that the administration has reduced the year-over-year -year increase from the original 28% plus or minus to a ballpark number of 14%. And as far as I can tell, this appears to be done in large part by offsetting the projected 2023-24 cost of many light items with infusions of cash from an estimated accumulated surplus cash fund of $900,000. Generally speaking, that's not good fiscal management. Ed, can I, can I respond to that? Yeah. Okay. So the cuts that we're seeing in the budget overview had nothing to do with the, the what was labeled as an emergency fund. That's a totally, I mean, the cuts are what they are. You know, their are vehicle, um, vehicles that needed to be replaced. They're not being replaced. There's a number of paving. There's a whole host of things that went into the budget cuts. If you're talking about the reserve, this emergency fund, um, if I not don't stand corrected, I think it was either last year or the year before the municipality voted to set aside up to but not to exceed 10% of their annual operating expenses. 
That money was set aside as a quote unquote emergency fund so that if a culvert blew out, they had some sort of catastrophic event that happened in, within the municipality, they wouldn't have to go to the bond bank or to the regular bank and borrow money. Um, you know, you and I can debate whether, you know, up to 10% um, is a realistic number, but at the end of the day, where that money comes from is tax dollars that you have already paid that is sitting in the general fund as uh, an insurance policy in case something happens. So what we're proposing is to use money that you've already paid individually to help reduce the overall cost of operating the municipality for this coming fiscal year and still leaving money in that emergency fund to uh, basically be insurance. It's quite unusual. Um, I don't know of any other municipality around that does that. I think it was a recommendation of the auditors to do that. Um, you know, many municipalities self-insure and say, if we have something catastrophic happen, um, we will borrow the money to do that. Um, it's probably good fiscal policy since the, the cost of borrowing money right now is pretty substantial, regardless if you're a municipality or not. But I think it's prudent, quite frankly, to utilize a portion of that money to help reduce um, the overall tax burden because it's tax dollars that you've already paid that we're, we're utilizing to do that. I, I agree with that, and I disagree with that. It depends on what budget line, line item you use it for. If you apply that to an expense for a durable item, uh, a maintenance uh, that's going to last for a while, equipment and so on, I would say that that borders on the reasonable. If it's used for recurring uh, commitments, such as payroll, for example, if you apply any of that to a line item for payroll, I think you're treading on dangerous ground. It's not proposed as a specific line item reduction. It's, it's, okay. the, yeah. the, it's, not, it's not utilized as a, as a specific line item reduction. What it's utilized is that we've funneled down to a bottom line number in the budget and we're proposing to reduce that bottom line number by $240,000. Well, perhaps on this rent, but on the budgets that I've seen, you can see on line items there's an offset in parentheses. So the last budget overview that I'm looking at, um, they put $240,000 as a fund balance in the general government, but essentially it, it funnels down to the bottom line. Okay, but where do you use it counts. Okay, well. Thanks, Ed. Gary okay. <clears throat> Marshall. I have a question for Paul. I don't know if she's still here. She is. Yeah, she okay. is. So, uh, the uh, workers' compensation, if I understood correctly, what she uh, reported was uh, approximately 1.15 modification. And that was uh, from. 2019 through 2020, I think? 2021. I'm sorry? 2021. 2021. Through 2021. Okay. So, uh, Paul, if you can tell me the trend on uh, accidents that have been reported in the latter part of that uh, period, has it gone up or down? I can do some research on that. <clears throat> My focus has been on the salaries and, like I said, the That'd be interesting to know what the trend is so we know whether we can expect the modification for next year to go down, which means that we have more money available, whether it's going to stay the same or whether we're going to have to pay more for uh, 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 all the uh, town employees. <coughs> so for those of you at home, Paula was saying she can get that information. That's okay. Oh, one, one sec. Okay. Go ahead and uh, introduce something. One thing right off before I stop, I have to read this is uh, the general fund. We pay taxes on that in the general fund for emergency. It's supposed to be used as emergency. It's 
not supposed to be used to balance the budget or get a budget down to a level that you think that the town will pass. And then you take that money and we're going to have to pay taxes again on that emergency fund to replenish it. So it's just not that simple. There must be a better way. I don't. And let me read this. Both the employees who work for Morristown and the taxpayers who fund their salaries have a common goal. We all care about and want the best for Morristown. The following is one description of mine that taxpayers recognize has happened to their town budget during the last two years. Remember, this budget has got to pass. In, in 2021, a decision that was made to try to remedy all the past errors in one year. Steps or years of service to the town were eliminated at once on pay scales. And after 30 years of service, it became 25 years of service for full retirement pension. This is how. Significant salary raises were automatically given to all employees and a number of new positions were created and added to the budget for salaries in 2021 and 2022. There was also a COLA raise on the top of the automatic raises given <coughs> of the 5.9% last year and the proposed 8.7 COLA rate for everyone in 2023. A total of 14.6 raises in two years. 14.6%. This has caused the budget and salaries to inflate from 553,000, not counting benefits, in 2021 to 878,000 not counting benefits in 2023. <coughs> An overall increase of $324,000 in two years for salaries of our own, not counting benefits. This is Morristown. This is not Stowe. This is not Woodstock. This is not Burlington. This is Morristown. <coughs> At the same time, the salary of the town administrator has increased from $63,989, not including benefits, to, in, 19, in 2021, to $101,754, not including benefits, in 2023. 59% increase in two years. This is Morristown. We have to have what we can afford. We can't afford that. I go on a little bit more. <clears throat> the overall town budget has increased, it was increased 12.5% last year, and you're looking at 135 this year. <clears throat> the taxpayers of Morristown cannot afford 26% increase in two years of the overall budget. These salary increases are not only unaffordable for the taxpayers, they are completely unsustainable. And the future of a size of our taxpayer credit, of a taxpayer base. The COLA increase were put in place in 2008 when the economy failed. 15 years later, with raising inflation and union, unions dictated salary figures, the towns must, must pay most now makes large COLA increases annually for small, for small towns like us obsolete. We all want more town employees to be well paid for the work and service in our town. There are many family and financial perks to working for your own town government rather than driving hours to work a day to other jobs that may pay more. When workers choose to work for state and local governments, they agree to work for what their taxpayers can afford. And we pay them. What, what we may, what may be less <clears throat> than they would pay for the same work industry and for, and in for the for-profit sector of corporate, corporate America. They know they're going to get paid less, but they love their town and they love what they do. Right now, the finance director and the TA 
are not flexible there. The body is not flexible. But they are cutting necessary monies from vital town services like the EMF, like the fire department, <laughs> like the police, uh, the police department, and adding $240,000 from our emergency fund to get the figures where you think the people will vote for you. There must be other solutions. These are a few of my solutions. Just a few. <clears throat> Uh, all open and new positions, not refilled. Not the least January 1st, 2004, a hiring freeze. A, direct, a, a, re a direct reaction director is part time until January 1st, 2024. <coughs> and a sustainable, a sustainable employee pay scale needs to be developed in the future. That talk that I have, that half of the proposed quota of the 8.7% be given to this budget. Cut it, hit, cut it in half. The 15 quota agreement is obsolete. No overtime be paid for non-essential workers. Salary workers right now work 37 hours a week. If they're overtime, they can work 40 hours a week, and I'm sure it wouldn't be. Also eliminate one maintenance supervisor position. One other solution to all this is to go and level fund last year's budget. That, that would take this proposed budget to next year. It would, if this would make this year's budget 12.5% increase, and then you apply the parameters, what you say will lower that four percent, and you have eight by eight point five percent increase in the budget, which I think the community could pass. You got that. You got all this money, and you put it out. You saw you saw last time. You felt the rage from the people. The people are angry. I could feel it. They turned down the $200,000 sidewalk <coughs> in a snap. They here, the other ticket, $240,000 of so the emergency fund to put into the budget to make it look like And the salaries as high as they, they are right now. Remember, the average $53,000 large sound residence, the average 53. You're going to ask them to pass that. It's going to be trouble. You may, you may, but I don't think that they're going to go far. Thank you. Did you? Uh, go ahead. I don't think you've talked yet, have you? Come on. Nancy, did you want to say something? Yeah, well, she's going to come up and then. Sure. Uh, Evelyn's from Marshall. Uh, just a question, a clarification. There was 2% they're talking about, you know, applying because that is the projected uh, growth on the uh, grand list. Is that like the least projected or is that, um, how did that, how does that figure come out? I've heard 2%, I've heard 4%. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the 2% um, represents. It's 2.11 is the assessor, our town assessor's estimate. Uh, that It's going to be pretty accurate. The books for that closed on uh, March 31st. Uh, so 2.11% is uh, our growth rate uh, for the grand list. I think the 4% you may have heard is the, the reduction from the budget increase to the tax increase as a result of that grand list growth. Oh, okay. that, no, it, it looks like I'm looking at the chart that's closer yeah. to 3%, but I think that's where the 4% could come from. So I just had a question. Just say your name again. Oh, Nancy Day. So I had a question. Um, so we're giving, we gave the employees 5% COLA last year, approximately we're going to give them another 8%. And then is there additional money in the budget to try to bring up some of these salaries? And there are the salaries for the for some of the employees are there additions additional step raises in the budget for to bring some of these employee salaries up 
There is money budgeted within the highway budget because we're in a contract negotiation year. Uh, that all depends upon how the budget ferrets out. So none of the other employees, uh, with the exception of you, are getting anything other than the percent increase, although some of them probably are in a step system. The, they are, yeah, that's they are in a step system. The 8.7 gets applied to the step system. So. And is the steps being adjusted? This, no. 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 no, 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 no. So, just to speak to Tom's uh, inference about the step, sorry, just to speak to Tom's um, uh, information on the step program, there was adjustments made in the police department because they're a, they're a union and they're a separate uh, entity. They have their own step system. They're equalized between them, but it's a different metric. Their step system went out 30 years. They're eligible to retire, I think, in 20 years. Is that correct? Yeah. So it made sense to reduce it from 30 to 25 because unless they stay here for 25 years, they're never going to max that out. And if they retire in 20 years, they're never going to get to that 25th step. On the municipal side, it was a 25-step program. And what they ended up doing is taking the first five steps out because they were so low in wages. It, if you went to step one and it was at $15 an hour, you're not gonna be able to hire anybody at that dollar value. So step six became the new step one. And that was, I think, around $19 and change. Is that correct, Eric? Correct. So that was the beginning wage. So if you were going to hire somebody that was brand new, had no experience, ex work experience out in that type of job that they were coming to us with, they would start at step one. They'd be making $19 and change. And that was a more competitive wage as we compete against the private sector in other municipalities. <laughs> So I guess what I was trying to understand is why this, uh, I know there's been a lot of um, discussion about the wages, but the corrections that this would suggest, which I agree probably there's a lot more nuance to it, um, to look at the qualifications of people. You know, right. I mean, some people walk into a job with a lot of qualifications, others don't. Um, but. Um, there is not an attempt in this year's budget to correct some of what. Mm -hmm. This is simply FYI, so that Thank so you. somebody working for the municipality compared to somebody else <laughs> working in a similar municipality, it shows the wage difference. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Can I ask a clarifying question on the pay scale? So, are the employees getting eight percent cola and a step? So if they're at step ten, they move to step eleven say step 11 is 2 percent higher than step 10 are they getting 8.7 and then 2 percent for the step so the the uh, police department's step scale has an increase of 1.5 percent between steps the general government non-union employees scales have a 1.6 percent step increase and the police de and the highway department has a 1.7 percent step increase so it's the total raise for, say, non-union, 8.7 plus 1.6? Correct. They take a step every year up until the end of the pay scale, then they're only eligible for the cost of living adjustment. So the total raises are more like 10.3-ish versus for this year. seven for this year? Correct. Okay. I did not understand that. And if you look at the, in the um, packet that we got, page 34, it has... Uh, the overall history from 06 when I think the agreement was made between the select board and the town um, non-union employees about uh, how the cost of living in index was going to be used to um, determine the, the raise. In some years it was zero, some years it was 5.9. 2022, 2023 is the highest. If you average them all out, it's about 2.9. Five seven percent increase plus the step, right? Plus the, plus plus the, the step. step. Yeah. So, the, mm -hmm. so then like four ish percent average raises historically. I don't know. Which is actually pretty in line with market. Yeah. Two point eight is not. Four point three is. That that includes this this year's numbers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, Bob and then Tony. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I guess what really is puzzling me and a lot of other folks that I've spoken with is we don't know what our reassessed value is on our homes. At best, I've been able to ascertain something in the neighborhood of 48% of the re previously assessed value. Can anybody speak to that? Yes. Is that somewhat? I'd yes. be glad to. So, and this is something that we we're going to bring up tonight anyway. So when, when you go through a reappraisal, if your home increases in value, your tax rate will go down, the, the municipal tax rate will go down because you only have to still achieve this much money to, uh, in terms of your tax dollars needed to be raised. So if your grand list increases by, or, or the appraised value, average appraised value of, your, of homes across Morrisville increases 20%, so, let's say. So um, with that increase in dollar value of your home, the actual tax rate will go down to still achieve that same level of taxes needed. So if your house goes up 20%, your taxes are not going up 20%. And that's and it's a pretty common, um, pretty <clears throat> common error for people who don't deal with this stuff every day. And it, it it puts out a fear factor that oh my God, you know, in May or June when the new reappraisal comes out, if my if my home is now worth four hundred thousand, it's going to be worth six hundred thousand. My taxes are going to go up that same rate, and that's not true. The tax rate will go down. Okay, well, got to remember, maybe. just to add to that, you got to remember that everyone's being reappraised. So if your house is going up 20%, let's say you're the average, that rate's going to go up 20% for everybody. Unless, of course, you've made some major renovations on your house over the last couple of years, or you've done some major demolition on your house and your, your property value goes yeah, down. under the understanding of that. So this raises another question now. I recently had my taxes done, and I didn't get this information firsthand from the tax person that did it, but my wife did and tried to convey that to me. We were told that the increase in our home could very definitely have an effect on your homestead tax rebate. Now, nobody's talked about this. So in other words, the state of Vermont gives every homeowner a tax rebate up to a certain income level and also based on the value of your property. So based on the value of our property, we're going to get pushed into a different bracket. Based on the reassessed value, we're going to get pushed into a different bracket, which means we are going to have a decrease in our homestead deduction so that's something i thought that, i thought a homestead reduction only affected the school taxes but i could be wrong yeah. well it's your know. overall tax rates right so your overall tax rates and the schools but it wouldn't it wouldn't affect your municipal tax no but well, if, it does in a way if the home value goes up because of our reappraisal it 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 trickles down. Sure it does. I mean, it, it, and so that's something that I don't know if anybody else in this room was aware of. I certainly wasn't uh, until my tax person said that uh, we ought to be writing to the state house because this has apparently been debated recently. And we had another tax person said to us that eventually this is going to go away. There's going to be no property tax rebate. What does that do to the average homeowner in our town? It's huge. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It's huge. So, you know, these are all, I, I totally appreciate everything that everyone in this town does for us. And I think they're worth what they're being paid. I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. But I do know that there's a firewall coming. And, you know, all this stuff is, it sneaks up on you. And you're not aware of it until all of a sudden it's there. And I would just throw that out there for consideration when you're going through 
all of these budget matters, there are looming things that we, none of us are totally aware of. But, and I was shocked when I heard that. I, I had no idea. But that's the reality of it. Tony? Uh, Tony, Cody from Morristown. So this question for Chris. Chris, um, I worked in Waterbury 33 years as you did, and I want to know the comparison to the, these employees versus what Waterbury's got for employees. Uh, same, about the same population, within a couple hundred. And I want to know why Waterbury runs so smoothly. Well, and I'll answer that question to the best of my ability. First of all, in terms of administration, Waterbury, uh, for its population, has more administration. You have a town manager form of government, so you have a town manager. You now have an assistant town manager. I wasn't there when I was there. Uh, assist, assistant town manager exists now. Um, there's a public works director. There's um, an a administrative assistant. There's uh, somebody who works as a clerk for water and sewer. There's a town clerk, assistant clerk. Um, there was a part-time engineer uh, on staff as well. And there was a full-time finance person. So their administrative costs were more than more filled and their budget is a million dollars less. This year they passed a $7 million budget. Um, in terms of employees, we don't have a police department. So Waterbury contracts with state police and the two state troopers cover part-time the entire town, whereas Morristown has a full-time police department. So there's a significant difference there in terms of numbers of employees and dollar value there. As far as the town uh, workers are concerned, um, I think it's pretty much on par in terms of the town highway, in terms of municipal employees. Um, and water and sewer are fee generated, so it really is um, a separate entity. I just want to add that uh, the median uh, income for Waterbury, Vermont is 65347 More sales is 54000 well, that's important. well, let me give you some real numbers from me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I retired from the post office, which always was a pretty good job. I carried mail for 35 years. Chris can vouch for that. I retired at $62,000. Okay, it's probably gone up a little bit since then. So it's not such a good job anymore. Okay. $62,000. I built my house. 35 years ago for $60,000, and now it's going to be worth $500,000. I'm telling you guys right now, we can't afford this 15%. And I don't care if the, I don't care who tells me any different. Anytime the appraisal goes down three years from now, if you're getting taxed on $500,000, that number shoots right back up there. So people can't afford it. So do what you want. Go, Jamie. James Brewster. Um, I'm wondering if someone could explain to me or help me better understand the emergency fund that we keep talking about using to offset the budget. Um, how it's funded, uh, what policy and stipulations there are on it, um, and are we in fact putting ourselves at any risk if we are to draw off of that? Can we go to Tina? Do you want to do Well, I, I think that Eric, um, if you'd be willing to, I, I wasn't here, so I, I don't know, and, and uh, you probably have the best handle on, on how that's managed within the municipality. So the voters, we, we get audited every year. Our auditors suggest that we keep a fund balance in our budget that would help to run the town of Morristown for a 30 day period of time. Now that the 30 day period of time cost wise fluctuates from town to town. We brought to the voters this year at town meeting 
a cap to that to be no more than 10% of the previous year's operating fund balance. So that equates to the ballpark of operating base budget 600 million. 606 yes. 600,000 Yeah, dollars uh, rounded off was last year's operating budget. So the, uh, the voters authorized us to keep no more than 10% undesignated funds. So, yes, 10% was the cap. If you'll hear me out, that was the, the article that passed. We asked the taxpayer set a cap at 10%. There is currently Almost 900000 Almost $900,000. So asking you for a 10% cap, working with our auditors, we feel that is a large enough amount of money, $616,000 is a large enough amount of money to have on hand to cover emergencies in any given year for the town of Morristown, and it equates to roughly a 30-day balance to be able to run the town in which the auditors have recommended to us. Tina reached out to our auditors in order to confirm that because we have a balance of almost $900,000, would it be appropriate and prudent for us to take the overage from that 10% and apply it toward next year's budget in order to reduce the tax burden on our voters? And they said, <coughs> yes, it would be prudent. And many towns are doing it around the state just for that very purpose because every municipality we've talked to, every last one, are facing double digit increases in their budget. We're not alone in this because we're not alone in the economy. The economy has impacted everyone across the board. So that's why the $240,000 figure is being used. That will bring our that undesignated fund balance, the quote unquote emergency fund, to a level just underneath that 10% mark that the voters authorize us to keep in that fund. Eric, am I correct that there's no there's no set tax rate that we are using to replenish the emergency fund? That's, that's <coughs> filled or money is allocated there because of surplus funds in the budget. Correct? That is correct. When we come in under budget, yeah. we keep that up to 10% account filled or that money filled, but it's not raised through tax dollars. There's no line item in the budget to raise money to fill that. It's from the overages if we have money left over at the end of the budget year. So if we don't have overages, then we're not replenishing we in theory if if this were to become a practice we could in theory whittle it down well we hope not to overrun our budget yeah. that's our goal I mean, uh, but yeah. if, if we had a year where we overran we wouldn't have any monies to add to it if there was room within that 10 percent margin so, but we wouldn't need to the money transfers year to year i guess my concern is that we have no guarantee that we're going to add to it year after year Exactly. It, it's up to 10%. If the yeah. if there is 8% in there and the select board is is comfortable at 8%, then 8% is fine. We just cannot exceed 10%. And we probably would not and want Eric, that. isn't it the last time we used this emergency fund in a significant way was the infamous Halloween storm? That's correct. And that cost the town almost, ha almost half a million dollars until we could get reimbursed from FEMA, which took until this year. And if I remember correctly, that was 2019? Yes. So in four years, we've replaced that money, plus perhaps more. I, so I hear what you're saying, Laura, but it sounds like, you know, at least we have a history of doing this and we've been able to work up a sizable fund. We, the other thing that's just worth noting is we are by far not the only town that would be using emergency funds correct. to pay down or pay down is the wrong word, to support a budget in what we all agree is a tough year. I know Stowe did this this year. I know St. Albans did it. Those Essex, are two notable Essex examples. Essex did it. So this is not uncharted territory, and I just want, just, want the public to understand that. Just but, to make a little bit things a little bit more clear, with the vote this year of the 10% that the voters approved, you cannot have more than 10% in that fund. 
And right now we have 900,000 in that fund. We cannot have more than 10%. That is the reason for utilizing the 240,000 to reduce taxpayer burden. That is the whole reason behind doing the whole reserve fund to begin with is when you have extra money, you don't just keep collecting the same tax money. You reduce the tax burden. In a year when you have to use an emergency fund, you would have to ask the taxpayers for more money. There's gonna be a policy on this, but it is designed to reduce the tax burden when we're doing well. And when we have crisis, we have to make that up. That's what this is all about. So what are, um, what are the guidelines on how we can use that money? The buy, guidelines- Could we buy a truck? No, you cannot That's use it for that. There are guidelines and they are stipulated by Vermont statute. Perfect. That's what I need. Okay. I, um, I, 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 and I hear what Tina is saying. I'm not trying to argue with my own staff member here. <laughs> okay. But I want to remind the board that a couple of years ago, we had a problem with an ambulance that wouldn't pass inspection. It was mid-budget year. And Bill Mapes was able to locate us a refurbished ambulance out of the Rutland area. We bought at a greatly reduced price and were able to supplement and put that into uh, into our, our fleet to replace the down ambulance and funds were used for that because it was deemed an emergency. So we don't, we don't use the money to go out and buy a dump truck because we want a dump truck. Right. It's there in the event an emergency occurs that is unexpected or unplanned. Yep. Okay. Tyler on, on Zoom. You have your hand up. Do you still want to speak? You have to unmute. Yes, I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm also cooking dinner at the same time, so I do apologize for that. Bring some down. I'm going to be right over. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I'll be quick. And again, I appreciate you guys for hosting this on Zoom and for adding that back in because I do think it's an important vehicle for people to be able to participate who have kids or have other responsibilities who may not be able to sit there in person. So I do appreciate you putting that back in. Um, I'll be brief. So. You know, and I'm I'm just for full disclosure. I'm a municipal employee, employee myself, not for Morrisville, but for the town of Richmond. I'm a zoning administrator, and I can anecdotally say that the conversations you're having here tonight are very similar to what's happened in in the town that I work for. I'm very sympathetic throughout this whole conversation. You know, to people who are working the private sector, who you know maybe don't see a cost of living increase every year. Who are who are seeing you know the prices at the grocery store continue to go up, prices for everything continue to go up. You know I'm I'm in the same boat you know uh, myself, but I do think we have to compare like things to like things, right? The labor market for municipal employees is just as tight, if not tighter, than it is for private sector employees, and that does that's across the board. That's highway department. That's more for lack of a better word, kind of like white collar positions, you know, administrative positions and things like that. And I just as an anecdote, I've been at the time doing my job for about six months and I was at the Vermont League of Cities and Towns host a town fair every year. I had one individual in particular come and actually try and get me to poach me away from the town I'm working for to come and work for their town. And I've been doing my job for six months. I had no credentials. I had no experience. This is my first zoning job. And they were offering me more money to try and, and with only six months of experience. Now, take somebody who has another skill, let's say CDL or any other certification. I know a lot of the highway guys have to have CDLs to operate town machinery, right? If you don't want to pay those raises, you know, they're going to go. There are other towns that may be willing to do that. And they're going to go work for those towns, or they're going to go work for the private sector because they have the marketable skill. And it's no different in this industry as it is in construction or anywhere else. It's the, trying to get and retain employees right now is brutal, no matter what the, what the market you're in. And you have to realize that you're not just losing the employee, right? You're losing the institutional knowledge that that employee has. Right. For my, for example, my position zoning, you know, it's not generally plug, plug and play. I've been doing this now for about a year and there's new stuff that I'm learning about my regulations every day. And I deal with it on a daily basis, you know, and there's other certifications, there's other things that I have to get. I mean, I've, I've been in the halfway through a, 
a four day floodplain manager, a FEMA floodplain manager training in Waterbury going over eight hours a day of just floodplain regulations that you have to administer as a zoning administrator. And I'm sure there's other certifications that town employees have to get that aren't in my job. So you have to realize when you lose people like that, you're not just going to find somebody off the street and to do this job, right? There's a lot of skills that kind of come, come with this. And, you know, and I, as some of you may know, you know, I did run for office, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of government for the sake of government. Right. But I, there's a difference between it's not really for me. It's never been a question of big government or small government. It's government. It's the right. It's good government. And sometimes that does cost money. And you have to realize that while, yes, I understand people, you know, are hurting and that staring down the barrel of a 30 percent budget increase isn't realistic. I don't think a 10 percent budget increase is either. So thank you, Tyler. In the middle, but thank you for your time, guys. Thank you. So, Ed, go ahead. Yes, my, my mind is still on uh, the news from Eric about the surpluses. This is great to hear. I didn't know any of these mechanics of it. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Uh, <clears throat> number one is 10% of what? You know, when you have a number, you should define it's, your program. It's 10% of the previous year's operating budget. So last year's operating budget, 10% of that value okay. 10 is... 10% of the previous year's operating... Right. Great. Okay, that's, that's, that's one. Um, so that would give you something in the ballpark of 900000 No. Last year's operating fund was 661000 in change. Okay, so that left you with... 660000 is what we're authorized. How did you end up with more than that? Well, cumulatively, so cumulatively, cumulatively over the years, that amount, because of proper budgeting by department heads, we have had overages, and that dollar amount every year is calculated by our auditors, okay. and they give us that figure in the August September time frame when the audit is complete. So it's grown. We don't feel, we didn't feel that nine hundred thousand dollars was appropriate for us to have in a budget just sitting there, and the auditors had recommended anywhere from seven to fifteen percent. Which left you with something to draw on. That's correct. So we asked the voters to cap that amount at ten percent. You voted on that this year. Correct. And it passed. So we implemented a cap on our own at 10 percent because we feel that number is is strong enough for us to manage any emergency that might befall us I, I, I'm, actually i agree with you very strongly i just went through this with cbcoa i was on the finance committee mm -hmm. and i most successfully argued that i mean they have a surplus <laughs> i was arguing over a couple of years that some of it needs to be used they had a 22 year history i analyzed 22 years of budgets and, and it seemed pretty consistent. How consistent is your year-to-year -year budget surplus? Do you have data? Do you have spreadsheets on that? Yeah, we do. Um, it, it does depend, of course, on the year and what's gone on and like when we have something like the FEMA flood. But in your town report, you'll see, uh, I, I don't have one with me, but you'll see there is a page on fund balances mm -hmm. and there is an unallocated fund balance and you can see how it's grown from year to year to year. So it's like a graph or something? No. Uh, well, it's not a graph, but it just says like in 2000, whatever, it was this, now it's this. So it, it grew this much in a year. And now if you look at it, you'll see it's $896,000. It's pretty... I mean, I'd like to see the numbers. How many years back does that go? Does well, I mean, I can go back as many years as you want, but what's in the town Excellent. report is probably four or five years. Okay. I'd be interested in seeing that uh, to the extent that that is consistent through different economies and different political climates in Washington, uh, conservative versus liberal, mm -hmm. uh, that it has a consistency through these different uh, environments one tends to be more confident in using in wanting to use that money. And the only thing else, and I, I would be more likely to support it rather than oppose it once, that, once I saw something like that, if it's consistent and reliable. The only other thing I'll say is I'm astounded that someone 
doesn't want you to use it for an investment like a car, <coughs> surpluses that you cannot absolutely rely on, uh, it should be used for durable items or in outright investments, never for recurring payments. Uh, so that's a separate issue that I made. Probably here. state statute. Well, the there. state the state statute tells you what you can use it for. But those guys are not perfect either. <laughs> no. <laughs> David. And it goes back to 2019 in the town report. Okay. If you go back into all the town reports since I've been here, and I've been here quite a long time, yeah. you will see that um, fund balance chart. So you could go back to probably 2006 and see it. Can I do less work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ring. I wanted to also talk about this fund balance and the, and the, uh, the uh, emergency fund. So what, what I've heard, I've heard some really very conflicting information because Chris said you could only take out 10%. No, what I, no, what no, I okay. said, it, it caps at 10%. All right. Okay, well now you change the story because it's capped. I'm not going to believe this. Okay. All right, so basically what I'm hearing is there was $900,000 in the emergency fund. And we passed the thing that said we could only keep 10% of last year's operating budget in that as a maximum now. So as that tells me that you can only have $66,100 in, no, that's what you said. 661000 10% of last year's. Operating last year's budget. Six, it was, was 6.6 million. Six million. Six million. Six million. Six million. Okay, so yes. you can have 661000 and there's a max now. Correct. So you, pull, you can pull out uh, approximately $240,000. Yes, sir. Which is, to yeah. keep that at that 10%. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, that's the number you're coming up with. For, for your fund balance that you're applying to the account. That's correct. Correct. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And, and I apologize if I was unclear to you. I wasn't intentional. Yeah, I thought you could only apply, take out 10% of that. Yeah. That's what you kind of stated. Okay. So I'm sorry if you misunderstood that. Okay. So it seems as if we have. Um, two, two proposals in front of us, or three. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Kathy. Could you inter introduce yourself to? Um. Yeah, Kathy. Um, I gotta put my earpiece away. Uh, we can't. We can't understand you. Okay, I can hear you now. Um, sorry, I have a couple of questions because it's gone by. Um, does anybody know if our homes are going to be appraised on um, the COVID sales of homes or or not? I'm not a lister, but I'll take a stab at it. The state of Vermont sets all the values. It's, it's a formula that the assessors use. So COVID had an impact on property values in Vermont, without a doubt. I don't want to use the words trust that the state took into account that some of those were very false. I believe that they set their assessment formula such that it accounted for some of that increase, but not all of it. Okay. And um, did I miss uh, what will happen with next year increase in raises? Did I, I might have heard maybe it was going to top out at 4.5 or if not what what will what do you have in um, mind for increases of next year um, leaving out the um, uh, you know the police department and the highway we won't know the exact figure Kathy there someone here spoke to a projection of an, a, over between four and five percent increase to the cost of living, but we won't know those figures and how they applied to our scales until the end of the first quarter, which is the end of September. So, just to be clear, though, isn't it your step will be one point six percent plus the cola for Correct. next year? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. That's, That's in line of the longevity pay plan. Yes. Right. So you're predict predicting that even non-union get the full COLA next year also? So if it's 8.7 next year, non-union would also get that? 
That, that's correct, Kathy. I, the history of that is the police department was the first union in town. Uh, I was a member of the department when we went union, and uh, the, uh, the standing policy right now for the police department uh, was mirrored into the non-union labor force, and then when the highway department went union, it was mirrored into theirs. So the, all three, uh, the two contractual agreements for the unions and the select board's longevity pay policy all read exactly the same, that an employee will receive uh, the cost of living adjustment based on the end of the first quarter, CPIW, and a step. <clears throat> Excuse me, even non-union? Even the non-union, yes. Okay. So we're really not going to be solving any problems because we're going to be here again next year, and it's even going to be higher. Um, mm -hmm. Would you consider not asking for the uh, up to 10% next year um, in the budget? I can't answer for next year. We're talking, we, we, aren't, we aren't done with our, our budget for the next no, fiscal year. But, but I, I get that. But if you're taking 240 out this year, um, that leaves uh, seven something. I, I'm not quite sure. But isn't that enough to carry our town for a year? Would you, um, would the select board, I guess not, well, Erica, it would be you because you're the one doing the budget. Would you consider not um, taking that? So, what, so next year, or you know, six to nine hundred thousand dollars out to put into a reserve. I don't. I, I, there are so many things that you said, Kathy, that I'm struggling to understand. But I want to address one thing clearly, because I have been beat up for this for uh, three months now. I do not create budgets. I create options. I bring them to the select board, the select board deliberates, and they pass a budget they feel is responsible, and we wait for the taxpayers to respond by a vote to tell us if they agree. I do not give pay raises. I don't have any authority in those fields. So please, stop saying that I create budgets, that I give pay raises. I'm tired of hearing it. I, you know, I didn't say you that you do. You do make the budget up, and it is up to the select board to accept it or not. Um, Kathy, but, so, Kathy, Eric works with Tina and all the department heads. It's not Eric alone doing this. Eric is there in the process, but he is not doing this alone. Right, and but you, the select you, board, the select board is up to us to make the final decisions on presenting a budget to the community. But you as a five member board do not sit down and create the budget is what I'm saying. We are responsible for the budget. You're responsible after it's created. It doesn't matter. You want to do semantics here, but we are responsible for the budget. Okay. So I don't know how to explain what I was saying. So we, you, we vote on taking 10% of the budget of last year's budget at every annual uh, town meeting or Australian ballot. I'm asking, would you consider not putting that into a line item and not asking for that next year, seeing you're gonna have over $700,000 already in emergency budget that could run the town? Kathy, I think I kind of understand the question. We're, we're not asking for 10% of the operating budget to go into the unallocated reserve fund. That's a fund that grows or decreases based on either a budget surplus or a budget deficit each year. Um, it is capped at 10% of the prior year's operating fund, but we are not directly mm -hmm. raising taxes for that fund. It, it ebbs and flows based on whether the budget has a, a deficit or a surplus. Is that accurate, Tina? Right, you, you don't raise taxpayer right. dollars to fund this fund. Yep, we're, we're not asking for that money each year. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let me ask you then yes. of thrift at or yeah. short at microphone. Yeah. They can't hear you. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. So, okay, you know, introduce yourself, please. It's true, you don't, you don't make up the budget, but you have been presenting the budget for the select board and, and uh, you, you, you have to take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. They are the responsible for finalizing it and you really haven't been doing your job or, or by golly we wouldn't have one by now. 
So I'm not putting all the blame on them. It's your responsibility uh, to do it. No, it's their responsibility <coughs> to present you a reasonable budget and, that the people will go along with. And, 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 and as far as the salaries go, I don't know who's doing them, but it's going to be a hard press to tell the person who lives in this town that makes $53,000 that all these, all these salaries are okay. And I'm tired of hearing people say that, you know, we got to pay these people or they'll leave. How long have you been here, Tina? How long have you been Tom, here? Tom, no. we're not going to, right, no, right. no. How long have they been here? Did you see them head out of town before they get these raises? These people work in this town because they love this town, not because of how much you're paying them. And, and it, it just irritates me to hear, we've got to raise these raises, uh, these these salaries up. How much you pay on those fire department people? You don't pay them squat, and they're still out there every damn day doing this. So it's not the money that's keeping people in this town. But you keep raising these taxes on us, it's going to be money that gets us out of this town because we can't afford to live here anymore. So be careful on this next budget because the people are angry. Thank you. I'm sorry, my talking. So I'd like to go back to we're talking about we have three scenarios I think in front of us tonight. Or are we ready to move in that direction? Two scenarios. Two scenarios. Two. So the the top one and the middle one. I, I had Basically. proposed at the prior meeting discussions around staggered start times for vacant and new positions, and I don't think we've really addressed that yet. I don't know if that's something the board's willing to discuss. Potentially delaying the hiring of police, highway, and the rec position. I'm not. I'm not saying eliminating, but delaying the start dates. Okay, and you saw the in the packet the information Jason gave us. I did. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not refuting the need for any of these positions. Right. I, I am. I am sincerely concerned that these two options on this piece of paper are not going to pass. So, what um, what information do you need? I guess I don't even know what the rest of the board would be amenable to. Um, you know, highway, certainly I think it makes sense to start before winter. We need people on plow routes. Do we, do we hold off on hiring the two highway positions until September, October? Um, do we hold off on one of the police positions until January? Do we hold off on the rec position until January? I mean, what would the, what would the budgetary impact be there? I'm assuming it would knock a couple more percent off. So I'm unclear, did we agree to fully fund two police officers? No, we have one vacant police position that's existing in the FY23 budget. There's only one new proposed police position. That's what I was going to say. So, but we have two open spots, correct? We have one open spot? One. 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 Okay. Oh, okay. I thought we had two. I thought we had two, too. That's I why I think I was they're confused. made, but one is already budgeted. So correct. it's not an addition. Correct. So it's one plus the addition. That's correct. Two. Correct. Thank you. There are two. So there yeah. is one position that we have not funded. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I, th I thought we had added that in and I missed that. Okay. And all of the highway positions are fully funded, but I believe there are two vacant, and that's not to say we could not reduce next year's budget by freezing the hiring process on those two positions. Yeah. And the difficulty with that, you're right, Travis, at the last meeting we did talk about these vacancies and you had mentioned it. And Sorry. Um, at the last meeting, we had talked about vacancies, mm -hmm. and we had talked about perhaps ex uh, creating vacancies into the near future to save money yep. for the budget. Having spoken to the superintendent of the highway, the highway superintendent, it's going to be it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to hire someone in September, October. That hasn't been on it hasn't been driving these trucks i expect them to be ready for the winter i mean you don't have to start the hiring process in september october you could start it in june july with the condition that the start date is we september, still need october. we still need training so there, yeah. there is a there is that other reality here too to to create to using vacancies to fund the budget i mean i at the last meeting i thought it was a great idea i've talked talk to people here and I've been swayed the other way because of primarily that argument yeah 
um, in highway. Yeah. In police, I'm not sure if that's the same in police, but we still have an eight hour shift every day that's manned yeah. or personed by one person. And, uh, and that's, highway, I'm talking about the police, police department right now. And that's, uh, yeah. and that's disconcerting. Yeah. And, uh, and we've lost an officer recently. So that probably puts a burden on the department elsewhere as well. And we know what, you know, I think most of us are, agree that our police department is doing one heck of a job, but still doing it mm -hmm. without the personnel that they want. And as Tyler said up there, I, you know, Tyler was very well spoken on Zoom. It, we, and I talked about this at the last meeting, it, it really, it does worry me. Workforce is a huge problem right now. Mm -hmm. That's what's and that's what's driving <coughs> salaries. And that's what's pushing salaries up as mm -hmm. well as um, as well as inflation. So the assumption that we're just going to be able to fill these spots whenever we want is oh we won't. We should start looking now, poor, now even if we sag or Probably a very poor assumption. So yeah. we can say that we're going to uh, <coughs> we're going to put two men two people on trucks come September, October, well great, if they exist, if they're out there, if they're not already, if we can't, if they're hire, not already hired by somebody If we can't else. hire them by October, we can't hire them by July. But if we hire them in July, maybe we have a, at least, it gives us a window to hire them rather, so having a five or six month window versus a one month window is a lot more reasonable. Pushing the start date out gives a larger window. We could start looking now for an October start date. You find them, you gotta hire them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they, nobody can wait. I mean, you know, you, who can wait for six months, especially when it's a career? That's my feeling. I will look at I'll look at the information that uh, J, Jason gave us about the police department and the amount of time it goes into. First of all, uh, interviewing and finding somebody, and then training them. They have the trainings you have to go through, I know. and then training them for our responsibility. It mm -hmm. takes about a year. I know. So it. It doesn't seem feasible to me to wait. I, I personally want both positions. I want this other position funded. Um, I'm very aware, uh, and if anybody watches the news, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Morrisville very uh, likely ha has the potential of being the gateway to, um, to the Northeast Kingdom for the drugs. We're already getting there. If they move in, and I have lived in Times Square, I have lived in Detroit, once it moves, and you look at what's happening in Burlington, once it moves in, it is next to impossible to get rid of. Um, if having an extra policeman driving around at night deters a drug dealer from standing on the corner, that is going to provide safety for the 5,500 people that live here. It's for all the children. It's going to keep people um, safe in their homes, in their cars. Um, to me, that is absolutely invaluable, and we have to acknowledge that fentanyl has changed the world. Um, it's so readily accessible um, that, you know, heroin is gone and that fentanyl is here and we have to address that. We're on major thoroughfares from uh, <coughs> Massachusetts and New York. They are, we are, they are streamlining straight up here. And to try to not, to try to save money when we're adding other positions to me is crazy. This benefits all 5,000, it, it benefits everybody who even drives into town. So I, I, to me, it's not even a question that we would even think about not funding this position. That's my feeling. I, I want to just, like, I'm not trying to attack yeah. the, the positions. I, I'm genuinely concerned that this is not going to pass. And I don't know, I, I'm trying not to target current employees. I'm trying to look at the positions as positions, the ones that are not held by anyone. Um, it, it seemed like a, a plausible option in my mind to knock a few more percent off to show that we are looking at, at personnel, quote unquote. Um, I just really strongly feel about this one. Yep. 
Is anybody else on the board? Because I have been mugged, yes. and it's not pretty. Okay. Christy? <laughs> She, no, she hasn't spoken at all tonight. Christy Smith, I just want to say when thinking about the budget, like you think about the dollars, it's obviously emotional and stressful. I also think a lot about the kind of community that I want to live in. I want a robust police department. I fully support funding, whatever they need. Obviously, if we read the papers and watch the news, we see what's going on, we need to stay ahead of it. I would like to fully fund the library at their request, and I would like to fully fund the rec position at full time. I think the police department and the rec and the library work together to keep people busy and you know productive and you know keep people safe. That's Thank you. <laughs> Tony. I'm just saying right from here. Like to hear no, me. you have to come up here. <laughs> come on. Well, this question for you, Judy. Well, that's okay. I want to know why the town needs three supervisors to do the roads here. I think we have one supervisor and, uh, and two, two, foremen. two foremen. And how many employees work for these three supervisors? I think right now I think there's 12 maybe and there's one position open. It kind of sounds like the post office. Mm -hmm. You know, too many Indians, not enough chiefs. So we do have two uh, buildings. Too many. Too many. Ed, you want suggestions? I'm giving them to you. Thank you. Did you want to speak? I wonder if speak, everyone here, you are. Ed Mountain, uh, Morristown, I wonder how many of the people here, including the select board, uh, read carefully Chief Luno's um, justification in asking for the additional patrolmen. Is, you know, are we all up yeah. to speed? Good, good. That was probably the single most compelling argument I've read so far for an increase. It is a, it's a difference of kind from other personnel increases. It's discontinuous from them uh, for exactly, to a great extent, exactly the reasons that Laura stated. Um, I think that needs to be supported. Elsewhere in positions, you have some flexibility. Of course, if you talk to a department head, they're going to make their case. And if you are capable, as we almost all are, of being emotionally influenced by a passionate speaker, you're going to come away from that always <coughs> thinking something different than what you went in hoping to maintain. You went in to make an argument, and you just got convinced the other way. Okay. Uh, if somehow the emotions could be taken out of this, we could we could get a budget that people are going to vote for. Thank you. We seem to have a hard Thank time you. taking the emotion out of this. David. Yeah. David Rank, I've got just one quick question. And now that I understand the two hundred and forty thousand dollars where it came from, I would like to know what would the budget have been if it wasn't there. Because at now you, I assume it's been kept, it's been calculated and factored in here, and we're still right now looking at a 13.1 percent increase in in what we're appropriating. And now, if we had a, a beautiful gift of 240 thousand dollars, which is kind of like maybe a one-time gift, next year we won't have that. I'd like to know what happens if you take in that 240 thousand dollars and really spent it on a bad culvert or or a bad bad road or something instead of applying it right here immediately to the budget what would be the what would be the calculation of of seeing it if that wasn't applied right directly to uh your the general government revenue you 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 put it right in there and it was just immediately used so and like i said it's still a 13.1 percent increase so if you had to have that two hundred forty thousand dollars in there, what would be the increase we'd be looking at instead? I think it was eight point nine. Yeah, it was about it was about three percent, right? That that knocked off sixteen point four. I think. Yeah, sixteen point four. So we'd be facing a sixteen point four percent increase in our budget if we didn't have that two hundred forty thousand dollars, correct? Yes. Okay. That's not factoring in the growth of the grand list. Okay. Which is going to um, reduce right. that by about. It's going to drop it down to close two, to 10. Go ahead. Two, well, it brings no, it down. Right around 16% anyway. Yeah. 
well, for, for the budget. I mean, budget and tax increase are two different things. I think it's an accurate correct. statement for the budget increase. Right. Same thing. But my understanding is, and listening to the other towns, that <coughs> other towns are doing this also because this is an unprecedented year with inflation and um, that uh, the inflation is already coming down and that the towns are caught in this, again, unprecedented time period. Um, so this is a one-time option to use this to offset that. Uh, this, this is just an anomaly of a year, is my understanding, we correct? We have to hope that cost of living is not 9% again. Next right. Year. right, which all the predictions are, are stated. It's already starting to come down. We don't know, but... But it's I've, already stated that the fact that we're going into a recession, so things are right. going to change a lot. Well, I'm, I'm not willing to propose that right now. Yeah, we, right. Yeah, we, we are not that, economics experts. Right. Yeah. Okay. In fact, it's around 16.7%, if it wasn't, and used it in that case. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on up. Can I have a I'm the recreation coordinator. Um, I just wanted to make the community aware of the need for I know that my position as a recreation coordinator touches on all age groups, um, but really specifically for child care um, and after school programs, summer camp programs. We have a, a, what has been a really successful after school program and summer camp within our community that has recently closed um, for the time being. There is no guarantee of if they were, will open or when they will open. Um, they have a summer camp program that they run. They have an after school program that they run. Uh, they also have vacation camp programs that they run in February, December, April, and uh, November. Um, that being said, families within our community are looking for care for their children. And I hear what you're saying, Laura, about the drugs coming into our community and families really being affected by fentanyl um, and a lot of different drugs that are coming in. We have so many families affected by this in our community. There are so many children in the school systems who have lost parents due to overdoses, who have been taken away and are in DCF custody. I work with caseworkers. Um, I work with the family center. I work with all kinds of people who are setting kids up to come to our programs um, who normally wouldn't be able to. Um, and we are really providing a service within our community as the recreation department for families in need. Um, as potentially being in a full-time position, I'm looking at being able to create revenue in other seasons of the year besides summer. Um, additionally, for all age groups, but specifically looking at childcare, um, in the months of November, December, February, and April. Um, I can't make those figures up of what that could be. I've really been focusing on the summer camp program and creating the structure that it needs to have to be carried forward <coughs> in, in years. Um, if I were in a full-time position, I would be able to expand recreation with our, and within our community so that it could generate revenue. But I can't just make up some kind of number um, for potential revenue for a program that I haven't created. Given the opportunity, I feel like this would really benefit the town uh, financially. Um, I could add revenue and not be a cost to the town. And also, and also, you and I have had a conversation about there's not there there are not activities planned for the 20 year olds and 20 to 40 year old age group. I've talked with some people in that age group, and that you and I have had these conversations about there's possibilities of designing programming for them. Um, I know one young man I spoke to who was here, and he said there's nothing for me here. Mm -hmm. So on Saturday, I'm taking a. Um, training with the state uh, wildlife department and I will be a let's go fishing instructor um, so we can offer fishing programs and I feel like that is a good um, 
versatile age-wise activity and could potentially attract that age group. Mm. I just, I just want to say, because you know I've been vocal about this, I've talked to lots of lots of people in town who say they don't participate in this program because they cannot afford it. People spoke here and said they cannot afford it. And I can say last week, I was a child of a single mom. Um, I was very lucky in the fact that someone approached me and said, we will um, give your child a sponsorship um, and fund your child to become a ballerina. I had a 30 year career. My mother was very proud. She would never have gone and asked for money. Eric said, when I said this last week, he said, uh, oh, well, there's money, but we're not allowed to talk, to talk about it. Tell them to call. Well, if, if it's going to be a town funded program, it has to be, we, it cannot be elitist. It needs to be put out there that there is funding come talk to us. And that's, I have a, I was so offended by that last week that, you know, oh, if you hear, know the right person, oh, call, they'll give you some money. So if that's you can just answer that, the school guidance counselors yeah. are set up and they work with families yeah. who they know need financial assistance. Unfortunately, those systems do get abused. So if people know that there is assistance in this capacity, yeah. anybody can apply for it. Not everybody needs it. The guidance <laughs> counselors are set up within the school systems that they are able to connect people with the, the services that they need, as well as um, child and uh, DCF workers that are their case managers who are set up in these I schools. understand that whole thing, believe me. I'm just, and I would love for Eric to clarify, because I hope I heard it wrong, I really do, that there was funding, but the funders had asked us not to advertise it. That's correct. So, to me, that's offensive. So, I, you know, since you said that, I've had uh, yeah. people come to me and say, if you have families who are in need, yeah. this is how we can provide for them. So, I mean, should we take money where really, they say we can't? We have. I don't want you to tell the poor kids. We I do mean, have systems in place yeah. for them, and we have. How do I they think, find out about it? Because the people I talk to don't don't know. You can don't send them it. directly to me. If you have people that you're talking to that are saying, I can't afford this, please send them to me. They're not going to tell. People are proud. You know, they just, they look at it and say they cannot afford it. And But there's walk assistance away. out there for them that I can connect them with. Well, they have. My number is on the website. You My have to tell them. My yeah. number is on the website. And if you call me, I can connect you with assistance. You've never been poor. I don't think you understand. I have, I've had the situation when I was living in Massachusetts that I had to go. Well, I bet no, that I had to go and tell the school that I could not afford to send my child to get so to the soccer, to participate in soccer, and I was able to get money. I had to do that. You do, but I'm so saying that if you, people have to decide that they're going to do that. We can't just yeah. sit there. And, but I am offended that you would speak. I would offend. I'm offended that you would speak to one of the staff I'm members sorry, in this town by insinuating her she doesn't always like being poor. We are way outside the bounds of what this meeting should be providing. I apologize. I'm just saying. If you would like to know, I, I, I do apologize. Borrow grocery money from my neighbors, and I, I was totally out of line. I apologize. I'm just saying the people I'm talking to are not contacting you because they they go to the website and see how much it is and and are saying we can't afford it because there's nothing on there that says if you need funding or if you need call that's all i'm saying that's all i'm saying we're gonna so okay we, we need to move on think, and I, again i apologize yeah chris i think chris wants to say something so one of the things that we talked about one of the things that we talked well was discussed um prior to me coming on the board it was it was uh it was, you know, it, it was all about generating income to offset the increase in going full time. And one of the things that was mentioned was um, because you are part time now, you really don't have the abilities or the time to invest in writing grant processes and such. So my question is, are there recreational uh, grants out there that Morristown may qualify for? Yes. Okay. So the the goal. 
um, is um, sometimes you need to spend a little money to get more money to come in to sustain a program. And I think as we look at this recreation, um, it's because not everybody's familiar with it, and maybe not everybody uses it, um, I think definitely in the town of Morristown there's a significant need. And, and we're having a growing population. All you have to do is drive around town and see the apartments that are going up here. Some of those are going to have kids in them. And so I, I see the participation moving forward um, being larger and the need and want to be larger in terms of recreation. And it's not only for the young, but it's also for the young at heart. <laughs> so, so, so I think you know, I'm willing, I, I as an individual select board member would be more than willing to take a risk on the fact of going full time on a recreation uh, director with a caveat that you have the responsibility to increase the revenue so that it becomes more of a closer to a, a self-sustaining entity that can provide services for everybody. And I, I would support that because I think you need to be given the chance to do it. Thank you. And I have, I have added additional programs. Um, I am conducting babysitting courses um, monthly. We have about eight students at this point who are signed up uh, for next Monday. Um, that is a, a program that I'm looking to continue throughout this year, next year. Um, we're doing soft camps, we're doing, like I'm talking about with fishing, um, those are a few. We, there's all kinds of things that I could do, and I would appreciate being given the opportunity to do that. Well, we've got, we've got somebody standing in front of us that has the energy and the ambition to want to make this program work and understanding the fact that the taxpayers up front right now are taking a, a chance. To, to see this come to fruition. And um, I just want to say thank you. Can, you. can you just speak to your grant writing? Have you written any grants yet? Do you have any background in grant writing? I have no proof. Okay. And I would like okay. to thank you for coming forward because your position has been a, a hot button ticket mm -hmm. item. And you have taken the courage, you've shown the courage to stand up here and talk to us in front of the whole, everybody here and on Zoom. And I. I applaud you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Tony, Tony's had his hand up. Let me get back to this. I want to know when we're going to call the question here. We're supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to do that, Tony. <laughs> You're not trying very hard. <laughs> well, we're giving everybody an opportunity to speak. Well, we're, we're creating positions now. We're not deleting. We should be deleting positions. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious, so I have to respond to what Travis you were uh, referring to before about the possibility of uh, delaying some tires, mm -hmm. particularly police, mm -hmm. which is a very important thing that I support fully, and I, I appreciate uh, what they do for us and want to keep drugs out of here. Uh, honestly, if uh, if this becomes a, a drug path uh, you know, for people, uh, I'll probably look at moving here, uh, out of here. So it's that important to me. Uh, I think that playing with the numbers is the wrong thing to do by delaying. And for the possibility that it might get turned down by the voters, I think that's very dangerous. I think that what we should have in front of us to vote on is the best budget, not something that delays something that takes the can down the road. <clears throat> so I, I just uh, feel that, that, you know, if this budget gets defeated, you've got to come back with a new budget, mm -hmm. and we've got to vote on that, mm -hmm. right? So by taking out or delaying hires, what does that really do? It doesn't help. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you letting us talk. Uh, you know, it's probably a hard process. 
We all your name, want a your name again. What's your name, Tom? <laughs> uh, we all want to defend a budget that will pass. And the police department cannot be done. I agree with you 100%. In fact, uh, what I agree with whatever they said, and I think what at the meeting, I wanted to give them all. The EMS is a minus budget. And the fire department it is is a minus budget, a, a very, very little increase. The two increases we have are the general fund and, and the maintenance. And that's where, if you're going to make cuts now, they have to come from there. Uh, you know, your rec department, we need that. They're, they're taking care of our kids and our grandkids. They have to say. I think the library has to say. They take care of everybody in town. And, and they have to say. So what do you got? What do you end up with? You have the maintenance department, you've got the general fund. And there you can make some cuts. As I suggest, you can cut the cola. Cola is 8.9, 8.7. That doesn't automatically mean you have to give all the cola. You can cut that in half and give a half the cola rates. That will help out in the budget and get it lowered. It will also help out on the perception of the president to realize that everybody is giving up something in this budget. There's nobody's going to be happy with the whole world. Nobody's not. I mean, everybody can't be happy with it. But if, if, if the president sees that everybody's participating, including the high race, uh, I think it'll be a better chance of that. That's all. Thanks, Take a moment. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and I. And I think that that's, you know, Tom, I think that, you know, um, we're a lot closer right now in agreement than perhaps we were a week ago in some of the things that you mentioned tonight. You know, I, I've come here um, into this budget process with fresh eyes and, and no bias. Um, and my, my perspective is, is that Morristown is an eight million dollar service industry and we don't sell a product we don't make a product what we what we do is we provide services and as we look across the board in terms of all of the departments they work 24 7 365 because if there's a need if i'm having a heart attack on sunday morning they're going to come to my house if you've got a chimney fire on Christmas Eve, they're going to come to your house. If you've got to go to work, the road department's out at 2 o'clock in the morning plowing your roads so that people can get where they need to go. And that's all we have to offer is services. Now, there's been a long-standing agreement, from my understanding, that dates back to 2008. That's, that's part of every employee's agreement when they sign on to come to work in Morristown. And that is the uh, CPIW, which I think you all have a copy of. Um, and there's also the STEP program. So that when Paula or anybody else sits down, calls now Human Resources, sits down with a new employee, this is the deal. When you sign on to come to work for us, you're committing to, to, to work, and we're committing to certain uh, stipulations of what we will provide to you as an employee. So for Morristown to turn around because of the extraordinary impact that the pandemic has had on all communities, for Morristown to turn around and say, yeah, we agreed to all of this stuff, and this agreement goes back to 2008, and you signed on to it, and we signed on to it, do we really want to be that community that says, well, maybe not? You know, maybe, maybe we'll step back from those agreements that we made and look at a different metric. Now, next year, or for any new hire, if you want to set up a new policy that's differentiated, I think what it does is it just sets not only a bad precedent for the employees that we have here working now, but anybody that ever wants to come to work for Morristown, is going to look at, at us as a community that's not a community of its word, that we go back on our, our commitments 
to our employees, which are really the lifeblood of, of what happens here. And I guess, you know, moving forward, you know, it seems that the people who bring the most value to our community, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to say to them, we don't value you because we are not a community of our word. And, I, and I, I'm sorry that I may come across as a little preachy about this, but I've been an employer for a long time and I've been involved in municipalities <coughs> And I think that your word is your word. We're Vermonters, damn it. And I think that you need to be a community of your word. And the budget has gone through an incredible amount of scrutiny. And it's all really, quite frankly, credited to you. As people who've shown up here every select board meeting and preached the gospel about saving money. And so we went from a 30% budget down to 11% budget, and, and we've shown you in dollars and cents what that equates to. And I think at the end of the day, if people take a good hard look at what the select board has done, what the departments have done, what the administration has done, and what you have done, that we could come together as a community and say, you know something, we've been dealt a bad hand here because of the high cost of the pandemic, We've done our due diligence and we've done our damn best to make this as affordable as we can. And I would really like to encourage the, the, the taxpayers of this community to say, you know something, I think, I think we can get on with this. And you know, we can walk away from this meeting to agree to disagree. I'll still talk with you on the phone, Tom. And, uh, and, and I'll still say hello to you at the grocery store. But I think at this point we're in an inflection and I, I truly believe that we're at a point where this budget is affordable as best as we can. I think you can see it in dollars and cents from the spreadsheet that Sarah and Tina have put together. And you can see where you fit into that metric. But I would really strongly encourage the community to say, listen, we're gonna stand by our employees. They're the ones that service us. That's all we've got to offer and let's, let's move on. So I appreciate the time that you gave me to say that, and uh, we can agree to disagree moving forward, but um, I, 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 think it's, uh, I think it speaks for itself. Good. Yeah. Well, first of all, I did not realize that there was a, a, a contract on the coast that was called that we have to do that. I don't have any intention to go back on a, on a contract or or anything like that. I, I didn't realize that. So okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and if this budget, whatever you guys decide tonight, you're going to have to, uh, and you're trying, and you're all going to have to do better work on getting that information out to the people. And you can help us with that. I will. I will. And you can help us in a positive way. <laughs> it all depends. Uh, I'm going to tell you how I think. If you think that I am not telling the truth, you just tell me what, what I'm not telling the truth. Anytime, and uh, but you have to get out there too. I will be out there and and and, and giving my opinion. But you guys have got to do it. One example is you put everything on your website. And, and one example is just twelve people applied for that job, and they asked, "Where did you get your information that a job was was available?" Nobody said the website. Four said front porch forum. Mm -hmm. The rest said press. Nobody said I found the information on your website. Because there's a lot of information there, doesn't mean the people are getting it. Your budget, if you want it to pass, whatever it is, you're going to have to get a better job of getting it out to the people. If you explain it like you explain it to us, you got a chance of getting that. Okay. Thanks. If you don't, Thanks, Tom. It won't. I'm not going to be a guest from the beginning. Well, I'm, going I'm going to hold you to your word. If I lie about what, not tell the truth or anything, you can call me on it and be careful because I'll call it on you. That's all I'm saying. Thank you, Tom. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I think that you. Yeah.
I think the meeting is going along late, very late, so I'll finish this up quickly. <laughs> Tell us um, your name again. Evelyn Throne Marsville. Uh, <coughs> My husband and I have spent a lot of time, he's really detail oriented, we've spent a lot of time going through all the numbers, really looking at things carefully. Um, <coughs> when I first came to the meeting and we were talking about quite a large increase, whatever it was, close to 30, I said, this there, and people started talking about the magic number of 10%. Oh, we can do it if it's 10%. I thought that was completely out of the question. And I first said thank you for the work you did in the beginning, but I think I say double thank you now because if it is down to basically 11% with the with the, um, the the growth in the brand list, I think that's miraculous. And this has been a tough year, and it's a tough year for individuals. So it's both. I mean, the government is suffering and trying to catch up with everything that happened. And the business people are. And, you know, but I think that we have to look at one thing at a time. Have you done your best? Have you done a great job? I think so. And I think, you know, I, I hope that people would support it. Thank you. Thank we'll you. take two more questions that are online. I'm sorry. We'll take three. That's it. Come on up here. I'll get the online people in a second. Getting old. Jamie Jarrett. Uh, just want to say thank you to everybody for hard work that everybody's put into it and to have a recreation director I, I'm kind of in agreement with this I think that we need to create revenue for this town other than taxes okay and there's a perfect example I worked for a municipality for 20 years back in New York and we had a recreation department that was second to none and it was built over a period of years to be able to do that that not only was it a self-sustaining department but it was an influx of revenue for the town itself so there's a lot of money to be made in recreation so mm -hmm. I, i'm a proponent of bringing somebody on for that secondly getting into the the percentages of of the budget I still, and I really hate to say this, but I still believe that if it's not at a minimum of 10%, we're gonna, it's going to be a hard sell. It really is going to be a hard sell. People are complaining about the cost of food, which we all know about, right? The cost of gasoline, <coughs> utilities, you name it. It's all out there, right? And we can sit there and say it's because of the pandemic, the wages are high. That's a fact of life, but I think moving forward, what this board and, and, the, and the town itself needs to look at is creative ways of reducing expenses and creating revenues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, online, I don't know who the first person is. What do you think? What's that name? Motorola, Mo Motorola, Edge. Motorola Edge? Edge. Name of, name of their device. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. Hi, sorry. This is Joanne Davis. I'm sorry. Can you, say that, can you say that again? It's Joanne Davis. And I just wanted to say two things. And and the first one is about this, uh, the the uh, payroll, the salary budget. You know, every time it's brought up, you fall back on the document that got signed in 2008. And I'm just kind of curious. Um, who besides maybe the select board was involved in the voting to make that a, a legal document. And uh, I don't think many of the 5,500 people in Morrisville were probably know, knew anything about that document before this year. And the second thing that I wanted to say is it's very disconcerting for me to tune into a meeting where people blow up. And that's happened at least twice in this meeting tonight. It's extremely inappropriate. If I did that at my work site, I'd be gone. And I think that people need to keep their emotions in check. Um, you can present your information. If you have a problem with somebody, talk to them after the meeting. It's not appropriate to blast people. And I, I just feel that's a really bad look for the entire town when you have people sitting in the town office who can get away with doing that. Thank and you. That's all I have. 
Thank you. Um, Kathy, can you introduce yourself, please? Um, Kathy Chafee. Uh, this is a question for Chris. I just want to um, verify something that you just said. Since 2008, every employee in the town of Morrisville has received a full COLA raise every year. Yes. No, no, well, it would be. It would be well, the COLA, the COLA raise is based on a federal metric and it's been in place since 2008. So in 2008, municipal employees received a 3.9% increase in their, in the, as a cost of living. In 2009, they received zero. And in 2016, they received zero. Uh, in 2020, they received a 1.6% COLA increase. And the only reason that we're talking about the significant change is that based on the metric and what the employees came in to the employment of the town of Morristown and the commitment we made based on this metric, knowing that some years they may not get anything and some years they will get something, um, is that they agreed to that, um, to that metric and the municipality agreed to that metric. And unfortunately, in these extraordinary times, it's, it's high. That's well, uh, yes. And, but I'm also looking at like next year, because I just heard tonight that if the COLA is 8.7 next year, that all employees will get that also. And if the police and the um, highway department are union, what's the purpose of going through being a union if all employees are gonna get the full COLA? Um, you know, I suggest that the ones that aren't union maybe go union if that's what you wanna do every year. But Kathy, um, I, yes. I, I really don't think it would benefit the town to encourage employees to unionize. <laughs> well, they're already getting the, the full COLA of what they would get and they're not even union. That's the point right there. They're all get ready. They're going to get the 8.7 this year, which is the full COLA, even the ones that are not union. I, so, uh, do you do you uh, am I re, am I explaining myself correctly there? Yeah, union, and, union and you are the correct. Time. I think you're also correct union with the time. the sentiment that if we did not treat non-union employees the same as the union employees, that they would unionize, and I, I feel pretty strongly that pushing a third union into the town would not benefit anybody. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna they're, point out. they're already getting union benefits. But anyways, so Chris, I'd like to thank you because um, you have been the most informative of any select board member that I have ever sat and listened to. And we are, if you continue doing this, <laughs> If you continue doing this and keep us involved and have the others follow you, I don't think we will have as much of a problem next year as we have this year. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is I'm sorry, but I really don't think this, this budget's going to pass this time. Um, but thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for being uh, transparent. Well, I, I want to say that all of this information has been a, I mean, where we've gotten to has been a complete team effort, not only from the select board's point of view, but the administration, but more importantly, the public that's brought us to this point. Um, the one, one thing before you leave, I, I didn't catch your name, I'm sorry, sir, that you stood up and, and talked about the 10% versus 11%. Um, as that translates to real dollars and cents, you know, if you owned a $400,000 home in Morristown and it was a 10% increase, the dollar, uh, what you'd be paying um, is $427 on increasing your tax. At 11%, it's a $50 difference. So you're, speaking, you're speaking to the choir. Okay, so <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, uh, this the problem is, is we don't have 5,000 people in this community that understand financial. All they see is what their tax dollar is. Right, and I think okay. it's incumbent on so us. So when you say 11%, right. 
10% versus 11%, that 1% come, may not be Come to the lot. microphone, because that's really important for people to hear. Jamie Jarrett. The difference between 10% and 1%, as we know, is 1%, right? But it's no different than if you go <laughs> car shopping, right? You see a car, and the car is listed for $39,999, right? They do that for a reason. Oh, wait, wait. They don't put 40000 on there because you're going to walk away. But you're thinking 39000 right? Right. Even though it's $999, it's $1 more would be $40,000. Did you work in retail? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've been in finance for yeah. the last yeah. 30 years here. So <clears throat> visually, that 1% makes a huge difference. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. But I, and I, I think it's incumbent on, on I, I think our job moving forward, quite frankly, is to move away from talking percentages because they really don't really mean a lot. Uh, what it means in your wallet is what it boils down to in dollars and cents. And I think that's really what the, what the taxpayers need to see. And I think that's what the taxpayers need to vote on. And it either, it's either going to work or it's not, but we're still responsible to provide services. You're right, but at the, at the bottom line is, irregardless, to, you, know, you can still put the percentage in there, but you still have to put the dollars in there. Right, I hear you. And without explanations, right, of people can look at this budget, and when I look at it, and I sit here and I'll go, you know, if I look at general, And again, I've been in finance for 30, 30 years here. But if I look at the budget here and I see general government, 2.8, almost $2.9 million, right? Last year's budget, 2.2. There's almost $700,000 difference. The year prior was only $2 million, or $2.1 million. We're talking over $800,000 in two years, just in the general general government, yeah. okay? So when people see that, they're sitting there going, well, why? Why is, that, why is that jumping so drastically? It went from 2 million to 2.2, then all of a sudden it went to 2.9. That's a lot of money. Without knowing where that all those dollars are going. Right, the devil's in the details. It, it is, Absolutely. without a doubt. Yeah, without and, a doubt. It's our responsibility to bring that to the table. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'll go back to the table. We have two scenarios in front of us. Someone want to propose have a discussion about this? I, I mean, I think we had a pretty clear consensus that the library funding was pretty widely supported. Um, and do we so look at full, saying. going to it full, which is the top mm -hmm. suggestion, or to the partial? The top suggestion includes the library. I thought this, incl right. this includes the library, but it's a reduced. Cor correct, the yeah. The middle one. I, I think full. I think the public was very much supporting fully yeah. funding the yes. library's request, is the vibe I got. Do you want to make that a motion? I don't want to make a motion. Huh? <laughs> I don't want to make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> so, Judy, can I make a suggestion? Yes, sir. As you agree with all those large ticket items like the library, if there's a general consensus with the board that you want to fully fund the library, you don't need a motion for every one of those decisions. Your motion tonight really is about adopting a budget that can be brought to the taxpayers in a vote. Right. So if, if you have a general consensus on an item, check check the box. You know, put it in there. Um, yeah. That's seventy four thousand dollars. I had a discussion today with a couple of people about highway positions. There are two vacancies right now. We carried a vacancy all winter. Mm -hmm. What it does is it requires our superintendent to plow highways, and we understand that that rate of pay on over time is higher than a, a truck driver. However, if you Promise me you won't take away the position that it still exists, but you don't fund one of those vacancies. That's about an $80,000 savings with pay and benefits. 
that offsets the 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 uh, seventy four thousand that you're putting back into the library and brings us down to that ten percent figure that Mr. Jarrett is is speaking to. So Eric, if if they were to find somebody, you <coughs> would hire them, correct? If, what if you're the, asking, is that how? No, I'm, I'm suggesting that the board would decide to not fund one of the two vacant positions such that it wouldn't be filled even if we found somebody. We wouldn't fill it this coming fiscal year. We would leave it vacant, but it still exists such that next budget building season we would bring the funding back for that position. But we would continue to exist on the current staffing uh, that, we've, that we've carried through the winter. Understood. I, for one, like that idea. I mean, I've been trying to figure out a way to mm -hmm. find that $74,000, and that would do it. That would cover it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that would give us that middle option, right? It, it would, yes. Leave it at 10.1%. Maybe even a hair under if we're doing 80,000 80, back for 74, get it pretty darn close to 10% tax increase. Also, we're estimating 2% grand list growth in this chart, and it sounds like we're going to be closer to 211. So we'd probably be under right 10. at 10%, if not under 10. Well, then you could possibly go with the original request that's the top one, because 11.16 and we, the grand list comes in. That's including the grand list. I think 11 point, yeah, includes but, uh, a grand list growth. Travis is saying the pot that the grand list could be coming in. Yeah, just a hair higher. I was still I was still thinking the middle option, which is fully funding the library, but now offsetting that with the sort of the freezing of one of the highway positions. Yeah. And it sounds you said you and Kevin have spoken about that. I am. It's, yeah. it's an option you're okay with, Kevin. Oh, okay. <laughs> So the middle option does give the library the 74000 that they want, if that we, they're requesting, yeah. be put back in tonight. Yes. Yeah. So, so our, what, I think what it also, we also have to talk about that um, Kevin's out plowing. Mm -hmm. So what responsibilities will he not be able to do when he's doing the job that someone else should be doing? <coughs> Kevin's, Kevin's responsibilities are, uh, more or less from a logistical standpoint, we have two foremen, one for each on the highway, when I call the highway, it's the out, outer limits of our community. And then we have our village foreman. And the, the jobs are, that they do are very distinctively different. It's a, a heavier construction element on the highway and a more utility-based on um, the village. Those two foremen are our operations managers. They're the ones that converse with Kevin and they do their long-range planning and they they oversee that work that is getting done, which allows Kevin to, to manage the paperwork flow. We're opening the pit. We've got RFPs to go out. We, we've got to manage contractors. Kevin has to be able to provide the logistical support so that our folks can do their job without having to send somebody out to run for, you know, gas or tools or something. Kevin is available to do that, but he's also managing our paperwork. Our permit, when we finally get it, has reporting requirements that are much more stringent than they were before. Kevin has to be the keeper of those records because it has to be reported to the state, to the Act 250, along with uh, the mine, the, the folks in the Bureau of Mines. So Kevin's role is to handle that paperwork, to perform logistics support for the operations manager and for the guys. So he has plenty to do in the wintertime Plowing being the focus, it's not as hard. That's when Kevin can do a lot of the, the we look at grants, doing grant writing. It's a, we're planning projects for the summer, our Act 64 clean water money. We, we're picking out the, the steep slopes on our back roads for stone lining. There's a lot of planning stuff that goes on in the winter, so it's not as huge an impact, barring your ripe old age, Kevin, uh, and getting up in the middle of the night. Um, he's managed to do this the last couple of winters. I, we can continue to manage doing that. Uh, it's just cost effective wise, there is a trade off. I mean, a, a, a truck driver's overtime is less than Kevin's overtime. Kevin is typically, that position is based to be work Monday to Friday, 8 to 4, 40 hours a week, um, not incurring overtime. But it, it, there's a bit of a trade off. 
I have, I have a concern about the trade-off, mm -hmm. personally. There's someone on Zoom. I didn't want to take anybody else. You want to, you want there to take is, another person? There is one other option. Um, we could fund, right, right now we're talking about bringing the emergency fund down to that 10% cap. And 10% is the cap, it's the maximum. We could take the 70, we could take additional monies to cover the 74, which would bring us down to about a 9% emergency fund, which would likely, given our past experience, it would refill itself over the course of the next 12 months. We can't, we don't know that for certain, but we've been adding about $100,000 a year to that fund, if not more. Or more than that. Or even more than that. 78,000 last year, 313,000 the year before, 214,000 the year before that. So if we took 74,000 out of the emergency fund, that would pay for the library. You don't add an additional. Right, mm -hmm. an additional. And, we, and keep and keep And allow Kevin to do his administrative duties that three, need to be done. 315,000 in fund balance, right? Approximately, right. Roughly. And that would leave the reserve fund at 9%. Still a chunk of money. 500 and some odd thousand. High 500s. Be about 580, 585, something like that. So how do we put this into a motion? Well, so can I just ask one question? So the funding of the additional police offers seems to be off the table for everyone? I support, no. I support we are. the funding that, of the police. I, that I, believe we, I, I support funding the police I believe officer. we're leaving the police position as is, yes. But the, ad, the additional one. The additional Co one. Correct, yeah, I believe we're all looking to leave that in the budget right. at this yeah. point. I think, unless you're not. I mean, that's that's what this would be, leaving the uh, police officer Correct. in the in the budget. That's my understanding. Correct. Yeah. Is that, yes. So the one, so the two positions, one is already funded, and the top one is funding the it's additional. Correct. Both of them are funding. Both, both, both of them are funding the additional police. The only difference between the these two is the library board. funding. Okay. I just want to make sure um, that I understand. So the right. there's two positions, but one position is already funded from last year. Okay. That's. Correct. So both these just options, yeah, them. don't affect the police department, don't affect the right. revenue. The only difference to between sure. these is this, this library. the uh, library. Right. Okay. I, I think you. the only thing that we're really discussing at this point is do we offset the library funding with the highway position or do we do it with fund balance? Is that so correct? Before we pull the trigger on the, the, before we pull the trigger on the taking more money out of the emergency fund, I'd like to hear from Kevin. He, he's the one that's got to do the job. Yeah. You yeah. don't fund it. So I, I, I kind of like to hear from Kevin. Just well, get his take. Come his, on down, Kev. Is, uh, not that I want to put you on the spot or anything, but it's a, it's a good thought. Kevin Barrett's how is your So, I mean, because this responsibility is going to fall onto you, you know, give us the pros and cons in terms of this decision that we're about to make, uh, whether to not fund this highway position and take money out of the reserve account or, or how we want to do this. Well, so that everyone is clear, this one position has been open now for, this will be the, if we go into this coming winter, it'll be two winters open. Okay. So it's already been open for a full winter now already. So as Eric stated, I'm not, Technically, my job is not to be out on roads. And since I've been in the town, that's all I've done every winter. This, yeah. is, this was my fourth winter through the fourth winter with the town. So by not funding it, obviously, it keeps me in that position of where I'm still out on roads. Uh, winter time, other than the grants that I should be looking at, trying to get funding and bringing money into uh, my department, it really doesn't adhere to any of the workflow. 
right? We, where we're here and where time is for Road plowing, them, sanding, salting. So it, it does stop me from bringing money into the department that way. Um, and again, my overtime budget is going to cost more than a truck driver's overtime. Okay. So the cost of overtime is a negative, and the lack of grant writing is also a negative. It's also a negative. My head is going to, as Kevin just mentioned, we've had a highway position vacant going back past last winter. Correct. We have another one vacant currently. We have a police position vacant currently. We're going to have, I would assume, a surplus as a result of that in FY23. Well, I, that's, I would assume that my payroll is not going to get hit with the $80,000. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Year, and that should move into the... Um, which line. is exactly where my head's going is the vacancies in this budget year I would hope just doing rough math in my head are going to cover a lot of you know the proposed additional 75,000 we're talking here I, I have to think that we're probably going to get close to the the number we were talking about to it begin works. with in terms of the fund balance it works it's because of vacancies and the yeah. surplus those are going to cause so it, Travis are you thinking that middle option and then withdraw an additional additional from fund balance and fully fund the highway positions is where my head's at right and now. Fund Kevin, those, are, you, are you seeing any other any like increase in interest of, of any sort? Probably not. Yeah, it's too early. Not the wages we pay. Yeah, it's too early. And that's really what it's come down to. Yeah. Uh, Tina said, or Paula said, we had a, a candidate last fall, and we just couldn't afford to bring him in. Because yeah. everybody's. We were about three dollars yeah. different. Everybody's you guys have a new contract coming up for July, right? So they wages, do. So wages will most likely go up for July. Yeah. That's yet to be seen. But yeah. I would assume hopefully, yes. Hopefully. Yeah. It's a, lot of, a lot of people competing <clears> for <throat> staff. So. Okay. Highway's particularly tough right now. I yep. can speak personally. Mm -hmm. You mean come up here, right? No, this. Thank you, Kevin. I think so. Are, yeah. are we good with Kevin? He's with I, I'm, good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. With Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. So, if we're all in agreement, would the motion be of sorts to accept a budget as presented in the packet with the two changes of increasing the fund balance utilization by seventy-five thousand and increasing the library funding by seventy-five thousand? Would that be an accurate way to phrase this? So that, that would How bring it down to as as presented in the packet. So as you know, we've got this <coughs> this summary that, sheet in our packet at thirteen point one. Right. It's that middle option. Right. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah I suppose we, we probably do don't even need to get that specific with it, do we? The library by seventy four thousand. Yeah. And do that by withdrawing an additional seventy four thousand from the reserve fund. Correct. And. When we did the, when we did these numbers, when Tina, I'm sure you probably did these numbers, the 10.07, mm -hmm. that was the grand list having a 2% effect. Yes, all of these are a grand list having a 2% growth. But in yes. fact, the grand list is estimated to be a little bit above that. That's what I've heard. Yeah, 2.11, which could bring it down to 9.9. .9. 9.95. It's going to be really close to being under 10. Remember that 9.9. <laughs> Where is he? Is he gone? Let, let's get it to 9.99. 9.99. Yeah, that's a Excuse good me? question. August, I believe. Yeah. No? Before that? Yeah. August, August is when it's lodged. I'm, I'm, and the May, beginning of June, I okay. think. Okay. I don't. It may. I don't know. I'm not a lesser, but. This spring, I think they'll start doing grievances and everything. Well, that's, but and that's not, oh, but that's, that's the um, appraisal. appraisal, not the grand list. Well, that's your, oh. that's to, what your grand list is based on. Okay. We set the tax start. rate in, in um, August, right. so all the grievances are over by then. Okay. So it's sometime, before, sometime be, late spring or early summer. But the information, we're not going to have the information in, until. We won't have an exact not number. Not until June. We won't have it by June 6th. Right. No. no. Not a specific yeah, so how does number. That, how does not having the exact number, how does that affect our. I mean, what you warn is the budget number. And then we can estimate the tax number. And it's going to have to be an estimate. We can't be precise. Those taxables don't come out until September. Anyway, exactly. So. Okay. Yeah. 
That's why when I get the yeah, figures, yeah. all the red yeah, estimates. Estimate, yeah. estimate, 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 and that's estimate. and that's really the best you can do is estimate the, the tax rates. The, the yeah, until it's yeah. actually lodged, you can only estimate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Judy, like, just uh, play devil's advocate here. Um, the highway position has now been open for two years, and they haven't been able to fill it. The one applicant that they had said no because we were in, in the in, on the radar in terms of what their their needs were. Um, I'm a little tentative to walk down the path of taking more money out of the reserve account for two reasons. One is is that. I think that there's some trepidation and misunderstanding in the public about really what that fund is and how it should be used. And I think the other piece here is, is that we have slashed and burned you know, through this budget process to get down to a more palatable number overall for the taxpayers. And I, you know, I think protecting the value of this reserve account as an emergency account um, means a lot to everybody that's going to vote on this. Um, so I think that I would, I would suggest that we ought, because of the history of the job opening in the highway department, to not fund that, leave the reserve account alone, do the middle budget at 10% or whatever that metric comes out to make a motion on that. And that highway position is approximately 80 with, benefits. with paying benefits. With benefits, benefits yeah for all in cost and just to your point Chris in the past other positions we have created have because of budget adjustments I uh, have have worked its way out right and, and I think right. too that you know for full disclosure you know when a, the HR position was open they did that all within the budget. Yeah, I mean, currently, you know, month to month, we're spot on. I mean, yeah. we haven't de deficit spent at all. Yeah. We've been able to manage all of the of the machinations of, of negotiations and yeah. provided services to the community in extraordinary times, and still stayed on budget, current budget. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, I just think that I'm not convinced that there's going to be a lot of fund balance money at the end of the year to add to this. I think that people feel pretty protective about this emergency fund. I, uh, I agree. Call it whatever you want. Um, I think that there's very good reason to use the 240. It mm -hmm. brings us down to a manageable level. Um, I, that, I, I talk too much tonight already. So. <laughs> No, but I think it's important that everybody realize that we, you know, in past years, because yeah. there are have been new positions created and people have been elevated, that it technically hasn't cost us anything. The, the money, you know, we stayed on budget. Yeah, yes. which yeah. is I think that's really impressive. Uh, Tina, for people to understand it. on the budget. Yeah. Well, it's not just so, me. All the department heads are very responsible for their budget, and they all we sit down yes, every so month and we talk about everything that's over and what are we going to do about it that's not just me i'm just the coordinator of the paperwork that's all your department heads yeah. Yeah. chris i think that's an excellent suggestion there i, I like the idea too i'm glad we're playing around with these different yeah. ideas yeah. I mean, I'll support that if the rest of the board yeah, does honestly i'm fine i'm fine with either option but i mean the fact that we haven't been able to fill it for two years but yeah. we we so, have the ability to if if we won't, Someone walks in the doors. We won't. Yeah. We won't in FY twenty four because we're removing the funding if we do this. There's not going to be funding for that. There's not going to be funding for that position in FY twenty four if we go that route. We're we're basically making the commitment to the town that we will put that funding back for FY twenty five, but we're removing it for FY twenty four. Yeah, that's my concern. So what we're talking about now is the middle option, giving seventy four, which would give seventy four thousand to the library but remove one highway position or, or do it with fund balance we just don't fund it we just don't fund it don't fund one highway position and it comes back up in the discussion in 25. yep so what what does the motion need to look like for us to move forward <laughs> and turn i mean do you frame that motion in dollars and cents 
that this much money is budgeted, this is how much money needs to be raised by taxes, or is it just a general, we accept this We're not going to take any a, more comments. I just want you to clarify and repeat what you decide on. We will. So we will all yeah. be yeah. easily yeah. understood. We'll do yeah. that. So we have to do it for ourselves. Do we, do we need a formal motion? So basically you're asking signing the, the, the motion or making a motion to sign the town meeting warrant so next general. week? Is that sort of the... The warning, the approval next week is only you're approving the warning and then the information the within it. approval of it with the, the budget by the board, right? Is it the warning with the budget figure? No, no. The, the warning I, is is how it's written and the numbers within it yes. to assure that they are accurate to what you want to send to the voters. Yeah. Tonight, the motion needs to be that we are uh, adopting okay. the, the budget as presented and you can verbally state the changes that you're making tonight okay. to that budget packet that was brought to you. Okay. The budget that's the, that has been presented includes a reduction to the library, though, so you want to make sure yeah, you, to address that. you address yeah. that when you're talking. Yep. Yeah. All right. It says slowly the one getting tired. Okay. <laughs> I, hear you. I hear you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make the motion that we accept the budget as presented with an increase. To 13 percent, which would equate to 10.07 percent tax rate increase. Estimated. Estimated. Funding the library reduced request of $225,000. No. 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 no, we want to fund the full request. I think of, you want to make the motion on the first one. On the, on the first, first one and then reduce the that first one includes the library being increased. Are we gonna fully fund the library or just do the partial funding? We're looking to fully fund it. Fully fund? Are okay. are we going the route of I think the, you should do what's in the packet? I agree. Because okay. that's what was I think I have an idea of how to phrase the motion, but I'm not yet clear on if we're doing the freezing of the highway position or the increased fund balance utilization. I don't, I don't know that we, we have, I don't think we can put that in a motion. Because the increased fund, the 240 is already in the budget, correct? Would you, would you do it not only informing the public as to your intent, but you're giving the direction to your finance director of uh, what numbers to inject either up or down in the, in the existing packet that was presented. That way she will be able to finalize and bring you that number and then you will see it in the warning to, for approval next week on the 27th. So okay. I think we need to say we're approving the budget as presented. The addition of $74,369 in funding to the library and then we need to address either the increased fund balance usage or the freezing of the highway position. I thought the 74000 for the library was only partial reimbursement. No. no the, the, the amount that we that's cut was 74369 okay. right. I've got to pack it up from last okay. last meeting when we right. did it. I'm sorry, so question. Does that include the pool to my recreational It does. Right? It, it, does. In that it yes. is. We, yeah. we, yeah. we never, yeah, we've talked about cutting or pausing oh, positions, okay. but they're, 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 they are all fully funded in the budget proposal in the packet. So it sounds like we're funding the library by leaving that position vacant. Right, okay. it washes I mean, the highway. Yes. So we are approving the budget as presented with the with the changes of increasing the funding to the library by seventy four thousand three hundred and sixty nine dollars, and with the change of reducing the highway salary line salary and benefit lines by eighty thousand dollars. Would that cover it? By the, by, the equivalent by of the pay and benefits of one position. Okay. So I'm going to take a crack at it. Uh, Tina will have to do the figures on the benefit <laughs> piece. Okay. So that's, uh, we don't have that exact figure, but it'll be the pay and benefits for one for one person. Yeah. So I, I, I got the motion. He got <laughs> Who gave it? I, I'm going to make it now. I'm going to make a motion that we approve the budget as presented in our packet with two changes, one being that we add $74,369 in funding back to the Morristown Centennial Library and the other change being that we remove funding equivalent to the salaries and benefits of one full-time highway position. Does that work? It does. I would second that. 
Okay. I have a motion, a second. I've had, I've had enough discussion. Okay. <laughs> enough discussion? Yes. Okay, good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion passed. All right, thank you, everybody. Okay. We're not done yet. I <laughs> know. What is the percentage? Are we the total percent is going to be right about 10. It's going to be right around a 10% tax increase. We, we, we will recalculate it. I don't know what it is right, right off the top. It's it's right. Right. We, we added Tom, we added 74, and took away 80. So it's right. probably going to be a little bit less. And, and the grand list growth is probably going to be a little bit higher. So yeah. I hope it's a little under 10%, but it's an estimate. Okay, we have um, review draft warning for budget revote. Oh, we have more. <laughs> do we have to do more? So that's what is on that last page, right? Yes, the last page of your packet. Okay. Um, and so, so are we? T you want the whole page reviewed or just the Article One review? Um, all of it. So basically, I'm bringing this to you as a draft in hopes the school is going to they haven't finalized it but the school has to also have a special election and one second Sarah can people take their conversations outside please thank you Sarah sorry so the school is going the school has to have a special election excuse me Ed Ed, Ed, excuse me, Ed, we're still having our meeting, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. So the school has to have a special election because of the dissolving the, the school district union. They have to have an election before July 1st. They have um, tentatively said it's going to be on June um, 6th. They've told all three of us communities to plan for that will be the school date. Um, so doing the timeline um, backing up, to meet that date, um, I think you don't. You would have to sign the official warning next Thursday to give me the 40 days to order all the ballots, because we have to do it in the same fashion as we originally did the first vote. Um, so this is just um, to bring it to your attention to the date of June 6 to have the election um, here. And the only article that I have is the budget revote. And the informational meeting on the first. Yes. Yeah, so the informational meeting needs to be ten days before. Okay. Um, well, within ten days. Sorry, no I'm too tired times. to yeah. present. I, I apologize. Uh, can people still come in with petitions at this point, or is um, uh, petitions for what? Um, no, the deadline for. Petitions for reconsideration has passed. It was 30 days after town meeting. And same thing for um, if anybody wanted to produce a new article, because we passed it last night that all articles will be on the ballot. Um, I guess technically anybody could bring an article that's not an article of reconsideration to the meeting next Thursday. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to, just curious. Mm -hmm. Or the select board could add an article. Right. Right. My recommendation would be to focus on getting a budget yes. passed. Um, do you need a, a? I don't need anything today. Okay. Um, I don't need any motion. I just need a head nod that I'm okay, trying to coordinate it to save taxpayer dollars to have it on the same day as the school. Yeah. It certainly yes. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to move on to approve the warrants. Yes, thank you. I need a motion. Thank you, everybody. I'll make a motion. We approve the warrants. Okay. Um, we don't have any. They're right there. They're right there. Oh, I've been passing them down. Yes, yeah, sorry. Hey, Paula, thank you. Did you sign them? Um, I have not signed them okay. yet, no. Uh, do I have a second? No, you feel better. We got a motion. I need a second to approve the warrants. I'll second it. Oh, okay. All those in, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. The warrants have passed. We're passing them down. Yeah, I didn't sign that. I can go that when it comes so back. I, okay. I guess I shouldn't have signed them until I Oh no, it's okay. okay. Um, I just want. To, I I had a conversation with Eric about this, and um, and um, just going to bring it at the end. I'm, 
kind of fading here, so I don't know how articulate I can be. Um, that uh, to the uh, the staff that's going to put together like a frequently asked question, something awesome. you brought up, Travis. Yep. And so if we have uh, suggestions, we're going to send them to Judy. Okay. And then awesome. The, they can put it up on the website. I think that's the best place for this information to go, directing mm -hmm. people to that website. And I agree. Okay. Are you talking about the budget? Yes. Okay. Budget. Judy, I reached out to us about that. I sent myself a reminder. Okay, okay. Right? Okay. We'll do that on Monday. Okay. We'll get info on, on that. Because yeah. we don't have much time. Just so I don't when remind the, myself. When the ballots go up, what, around the 15th of May? Yeah, I have the whole timeline that I've done up for <coughs> myself. I can email it to you guys if you awesome. are interested interested um so i'm assuming you will sign the warning next thursday night hopefully it should be a quick meeting i don't see anything else needing to be on the agenda um, not to tell you what to do but that's just my suggestion um and then i'll i will order ballots the next day i because there's no candidates, I don't have to, there, usually there's this window where I have to wait if candidates are gonna withdraw. So <coughs> the issue is the timing of them. Um, the ballots will have to be out by May 17th. So taxes in Morristown are due May 15th for those board, new board members. It takes about three days to stuff them. So I've already emailed the BCA and said, I need major help more than usual because um, we are all hands on deck. On May 15th, we work late as it is. There's a select board meeting that night, too. Um, I won't be able, my staff will not be able to stuff, we can give directions, but we will not be able to stuff ballots that um, day. Oh my gosh. So, um, and we statutorily will have to get them out by the 17th, so we will need right. assistance. So, and I'm just thinking um, about asking people to write positive comments or suggestions or support about our budget that we all do and and uh, maybe back up with some um, language <laughs> I don't have the words Thank you. So not for anymore well I'm kind of wondering yeah that's kind of good. can you pass do we, this to Eric do we talk about what that strategy is going to be to make sure we get the information on this budget out there. Well, do we plan, that's me. you know, perhaps uh, meetings with the community where maybe two select board members are present? Can't do more than two. I don't. To answer questions, I'd be into that. I mean, it's we do need to do what we need to do to get this done. I'm wondering, should this be an agenda item for next Thursday? It's a special, special meeting, but maybe just a, Talk about a board strategy. conversation about kind of brainstorm. getting, getting the, getting oh, the word out about the budget. Not inviting the audience for quest Q and A, just for us. You're saying just for us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and asking asking the public for support. Yeah. 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 So it just be two items on the agenda. Yeah. So what what's the second? Sorry, I'm not used to being two D. What's the board, <laughs> board what's the second? Board discussion regarding public outreach on budget. Discussion. Oops. Put away my agenda already. I think I think we're done here. Yeah, do we need to make a motion to adjourn? We do. Yeah. I was, oh, I had wanted to talk about the election when the room was full and I had the <laughs> audience, so I guess I'll save it to, the, I just wanted to thank everybody in the staff and I've had, I almost want to cry, like overwhelming support from the community about it. Yeah. Um, it's very touching. It was an so awesome I just, meeting. You guys did a great the, job. Um, I'll bring it up, hopefully there, when there's more people. I just, I, I know this guy, Henry, has been on. Henry, and sorry to have ignored you. Do you want to speak? Yes, I would. I, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my question is, that at one point um, in the budget, there was money set aside to do Zoom meetings for the planning and zoning. Uh, is that still in the budget? We, yes, the... Yes. the, the um, Zoom option is still in the budget. All right, then. Back in the budget. Correct. Yeah. We, we added that money back in. Okay, thank you. Thank well, you for that. And the last thing I want to say is 
I'm impressed with the last 10 minutes of this meeting uh, in the fact that you guys succeeded in getting something done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for having me. I'll make a motion out. to adjourn thank the you. meeting. Any second? Second. Good. Motion second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. See you Thursday.